It's me, my alpha baby, Southside, worldwide. While my people dying on the grind high, trying to provide for pride. Plot and devise, they trap and divide and capitalize. Stop sleepwalking, lover, open your eyes. Scope of the sky, see the stars. What do you mean you can't fly? Propaganda got you thinking fate is homicide, hoping that you see tomorrow. Look at you searching, all up in the church, but the pastor can't reverse this. We got we all immersed in this. Only we can proceed with the surgical fix. Now listen, open heart like Dr. Daniel H. Williams. We gotta stop the killing, then we can reign like God cut the shower on. I cannot be tame. Come and let me show you how to aim. For this war, you'll need your third eye. No more maladaptiveness, pick sides. No more murder, one less organized. Like a Fortune 5. Play the game like it's 4 and 5. To survive now. For this war, you'll need your third eye. No more maladaptiveness, pick sides. No more murder, one less organized. Like a Fortune 5. Play the game like it's 4 and 5. So the midget to control a giant. The giant must see the midget as a giant. Himself as a midget. It's psycho science. Free your mind and change your thoughts. Take the chain off your brain. What you see. Is war. BIC, black inferior complex. We can uproot all this poisonous nonsense. Until we do, no contest. I spit fire one, two, my check. Master the language, they mask wicked things with vocab that we can't grip. Hold fast, everything could worsen. If we ignore the souls in the workings, I'm shielded by serpents. The hoodie in the person. When I write, spit, articulate the way the earth circles like a whirlwind. Jesus never came. Come and let me show you how to aim. For this war, you'll need your third eye. No more maladaptiveness, big size. No more murder, one less organized. Like a Fortune 5. Play the game like it's 4 and 5. To survive now. For this war, you'll need your third eye. No more maladaptiveness, big size. No more murder, one less organized. Like a Fortune 5. Play the game like it's 4 and 5. A to drug dealer now. needs a drug fiend. A crime system needs a criminal. Sellers need buyers. They condition us to spin a loot. Keep our habits visceral. Second nature. First they play on our esteem, then they captivate us Using social agents, black celebrities Pedal for payment, the corporate way in Control your desires and cravings or living mayhem It should be coming crystal clear that our ignorance is beneficial Here, in other words, they control what you like and value Our beliefs and the deity we bow to Through this foul view, it's impossible to see the roots The flim flam Trojan horse tactics that they use Cameras capture every view I can teach you subterfuge, they're never out of range let me show you how to aim For this war, you'll need your third eye No more maladaptiveness, big size No more murder, one less organized Like a Fortune 5 Play the game like it's 4 and 5 To survive now For this war, you'll need your third eye No more maladaptiveness, big size No more murder, one less organized Like a Fortune 5 Play the game like it's 4 and 5 To survive now Alright My ancestors woke me up this morning. They said, son, you do know what time it is, don't you? I said, what time is that? They said, it's war time, so welcome to the war front. First, let me thank everybody that came out. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out this Sunday morning. I'm not going to say what places you might have been, but there's some other places that you find a lot of black people on Sunday morning, so we really appreciate you coming on out today. Uh, we're going to talk about something uh, very important to us. Uh, talk about black business and what's going on with black business ethics and why is there a crisis in black business in the black world community. I want to let people know that this is a lecture, so this is the first one that we're doing uh, to start off our, our, a different phase of War on the Horizon, but we're not just uh, any longer just uh, involved in the process of doing lectures. Now we want to build institutions and start doing things in the black community. So this is the first week, but we'll be meeting here every Sunday unless we uh, make people aware and announce that we're not going to be here. So that means next Sunday we'll be here, same time, 11 to 1, and we're going to start building and doing some things in our community. So uh, we figured that we would start our first week of building this institution called War on the Horizon uh, with a lecture because that's our bread and butter, what we've been doing for over the past um, decade or longer, uh, doing the lectures and things of that nature. And we're going to start moving into building and organizing in the community. So we thank you for coming out. Uh, we hope we see you again next week and all the weeks after that uh, as we do things that are, are relevant to the black world community. I want to get right into our discussion, black business ethics, because it's something that's uh, critical and important to all of us. If we understand um, the condition of our community now, we know that most places that we go, 
we cannot come to facilities like this and have these kind of discussions because most things in the black community are not owned by black people. Check? That's right. That's right. So uh, this lecture is not going to be quite as deep as some of the ones that we've typically done, you know, uh, with some very, very, very uh, heavy uh, um, topics that we deal with. But nevertheless, it's extremely relevant, and it explains why we can't deal with some of these other issues. And there are four main things that if you watch this lecture, you're going to walk away with having an answer to. Four very critical and important things that you're going to have to answer to. One, why are black businesses important? I think that because we don't teach business in our schools, not really from a perspective that we should, most of our people don't understand why business is important and why does it matter if black people have businesses. Two, why do black businesses fail? It's fine to talk about the fact we need businesses, but we start businesses and most black businesses fold within their first year. Today we're going to talk about some of those standard reasons why black businesses fail. And that will help people understand if you don't do those things, then you can stay in business and have a better chance of lasting for a longer time. Third, what's the psychology of the black customer? You got to understand something. When your customer walks in that door, most black businesses thrive off of the black dollar. Everybody in every other community studies the black consumer understands them, knows how to get their dollar. But black people, we don't take the time to understand where our people are, and thus it's easier for other people to capture the black dollar than ourselves. And lastly, what are the challenges of the black entrepreneur? Because it's not as simple as it sounds for a black person to go into business and stay in business because of the condition of our community. We're going to talk about a little bit of that today. So we're going to start right at the beginning talking about what is business. So we understand, when we talk about business, what are we talking about? We talking about an individual, organization, or enterprise engaged in providing goods and or services to other, often in exchange for some benefit. Why do we say often in exchange for some benefit? Because sometimes we do business. Some people are in business and don't even realize it. Like if you're one of those people that everybody you know know you give good advice, and anything that's going on in their life, they come and sit down with you and they're always telling you stuff. You don't charge them a dollar, but you're in business. Because you're doing something that is a service to that person or those people on a consistent basis that you could charge for, for, but you don't. So you're not actually getting a benefit unless you just feel good about helping people. So you're in business. But we're not going to talk about that kind of business today. We're going to talk about for-profit business, like where we are here, right here today. When you're doing business in exchange for money. Now let's differentiate because we got to understand something. We say black business, but they're two different things. One is a black-owned business. One is a black business. Let's talk about what the difference between the two is. A black-owned business is a business owned by a person with a black mother and a black father. In other words, if a black person, they got a black mother and a black father, they black. If they own a business, then it's a black-owned business. We remember BET first came out. Originally, it was Bob Johnson. That was a, a black-owned business. Bob Johnson was black, and he had a business. But now we know that BET has not exactly been the shining example of responsibility to the black community. Hence, it's black owned, but it's not really good for the black community. So we got to differentiate between a black owned business and a black business. What is a black business? A black business is a business owned by a person with a black mother and a black father. Again, it's got to be black owned. Where the owner uses the business and or its proceeds to help the black people and the black race progress as a race of people. In other words, what are we talking about? Talking about where we are right now. See, the difference between a, a black-owned business and a black business, yes, this business here right here, Secrets of Nature, is black-owned. But guess what? He doesn't, this, he, he doesn't charge us to come in here and do these lectures. He does this so the community can have this. But then you look at what he's selling our people. You look at what he's selling our people, you got fruits. You got vitamins, you got soap, all things that offer life. In other words, you can come to this place and you can get life any day of the week. When it's open, you come in the doors, everywhere you look, they got pictures on the wall with the body and, and, and the different parts of the body and what you need to do to keep yourself clean and healthy. If you want to live and be a black person to be healthy, you can come in and get food. We all going to eat every day. You can get food. You can get things that are life affirming. And most times you can tell a black business simply by what they're selling. But you can't always do that. I want to make that point. Sometimes you got a brother or sister that owns a business, and maybe all of their clientele is white. So you wouldn't know that this is a black business, but they take that money and what they get, and they go in the community to help black people have black community centers and things of that nature. So not every black-owned business or black business 
you know as a black business because you don't always know what that person is doing with their proceeds. But in general, for the most part, the general consensus is the vast majority of black businesses in this country make their living off of the black dollar. Because quite frankly, nobody else, even if we have a superior product, in most cases, no other community will support black people other than black people. And with that being the case, a black business is a business, generally speaking, you can look at and see what they sell on our people and determine that's a business that's good for our community. And that's what makes it a black business, not just that it's owned by black people. And so when we go and look at this and we look at the condition of our people, we look at the history of our people, look at the history of our race. What we will find is that if you look throughout history, whenever there were organizations designed to help black people, whenever you had organizations that uplifted people, that developed uh, educational things in the black community. Whenever you had anything that was going on positive in the black community, it was sponsored by organizations whose particular purpose was uplifting black people. But guess what? You know how they were able to support our people? Through black business. That's where the financial, that's where the dollars came from that gave us rooms like this that could teach our people. Uh, that's where, in the case of organizations like the UNIA, the largest self-help black organization in the history of the Western Hemisphere, Marcus Mazzai Garvey, started this institution. People don't realize that the birth of black consciousness in terms of books and our, and, our, and, our, and our researchers and historians and griots being able to find information to give to us, to uplift us and make us feel proud about ourselves, came at the same time that Garvey had these millions of black people around the country who were interested in the upliftment of the black race. And so what he would do, he would tell every chapter, look, we got a brother that's done a book and studied and researched history of our people. You're going to pay for them to come in. You're going to gather money. You're going to bring all your members together, all your churches, all your, your hospitals, everybody from every segment of the community is part of UNIA. And you all are going to go hear this person who's done all this research about our race. You're going to hear them. You're going to buy their books and you're going to support them. This is how many of the brothers and sisters who gave us our history back after slavery were able to finance it. Because of what? Because of self-help institutions. Why was the UNIA able to thrive? Because he had members who had their own tailor shops, members who had their own dry cleaners, people who had their own stores, corner stores, grocery stores, farms. The black dollar is what sponsors growth and development in the black community. And so we look at other uh, great economic meccas like Black Wall Street. Many people haven't heard of Black Wall Street. One of the most thriving economic communities in the history of this country. Rival any white community during that time in the 1920s and it was burned down because of that very reason. The Nation of Islam. Very powerful organization has been around for the balance of the 20th century. What was the Nation of Islam able to do? They had farms. They, they worked with people like uh, Muhammad Ali so they had substantial money coming through that. The wealth of black people developing through business was able to come out and then translate into schools, into education, into opportunity to create jobs for our own people. This is why the black owned business is so important to us, brothers and sisters. So we're just going to start off with just some basic understanding of some reasons why black businesses are critical to the wealth of the black community. One, black people need our own black businesses to promote our black racial self-esteem. Let me tell you something. When a child walks into a business that's owned by a black person, the first, that is the beginning of the light that goes off in that child's mind that they can be independent. They look around and see a black person, they come in and in a secrets and agency, Brother Coy, and all these black people doing this, and they go, man, one day I could do something like this. But when I have mine, I'm gonna have two stories. And I'm gonna have, you know, you know how children are, they start going, and their mind is, it starts right there because they've seen somebody that looks like them can do it, then that means they can do it. This is very important for us to understand what black uh, businesses do to the minds of our youth. Black employers who care about our community tend to treat their black employees like family. The bottom line is nobody really likes black people that much and if they hire us, they hire us to do a job. But if you have a black person who's responsible in business, they tend to care about that other black person and when your child's ready to go to college and you've been working there 10 or 15 years, they're gonna contribute to that child because you feel like you're part of the family. So we have a family structure when you have a black owned business in a black business. Black people prefer to spend money with one another under most healthy circumstances. And it's not just black people. Under most circumstances, every race has a preference. If you're gonna bring somebody in your house to do some work, you want somebody to look like you, that you kinda know y'all have a similar culture. And it's no different for black people. So it's really important because black people will prefer to spend their money with black people if we will treat our people right in business. 
Also, the black business is an extension of the black work ethic and sense of racial pride. Where there are no black businesses, there's a lowered black work ethic and low black self-esteem. I want you to really think about it. If you can think about it, because we don't really have a lot of these now, but you can remember some brothers and sisters in here remember a time when most of the businesses in the community were black owned. That's right, good. Now I want you to remember this. I want you to think about the communities where black people own those businesses. Even if you know some of them now, like in Largo, you have communities where it's a lot of black owned people, uh, businesses. I want you to think about the way the people that go to those businesses dress, how they talk, how they treat one another. Just the general climate of an environment where there are a lot of black owned businesses. Usually people dress pretty decent. Usually they treat each other with courtesy. That's just a, a general sense, if you start thinking about it, how people act. I want you to think about a community, prime example, this here, where very few to none of the businesses are owned by black people. People are high, they're drunk, barely dressed, they use filthy language. There's some real impact that black people have when they see black people running and controlling business infrastructure in their community. It lifts them up, it makes them feel good. They can spend their dollar with their brother or sister and they can have interaction and they can say, this is part of my community. When everybody that's selling them something looks different than them, it's not a conscious thing, but subconsciously it tells them that they're inferior, they don't have the ability to do anything, and that translates into everything from how they talk to each other, how they treat one another, and everything that we see in our community, and really self-esteem. The self-esteem is shot through the roof, and you can see that anywhere you go in America. Black people gain racial loyalty by producing jobs for one another. I remember I had a friend named, uh, a brother I used to play basketball with at Run and Shoot, named Reggie. And he, uh, he worked for a cat named Mo, who have a, a, a car detailing shop over on Pennsylvania Avenue in Maryland, on the Maryland side. And uh, we were sitting down playing ball one day, we were on a bench, and Mo out there shooting three-pointers like he do, you know, knocking them down. And so we were talking, and I remember, I'll never forget the way he was real passionate, because, you know, Reggie, real easygoing guy, but I remember how real passionate he got when he started talking about Mo. He said, see that man right there? He said, for the last five years, that man gave me a job. He said, can't nobody tell me nothing about that man. I got his back forever. He said, that's my man. He said, I got his back. I want you to understand that. He got real passionate. And it dawned on me. I said, man, when you help a man pay his bills and feed his family, that's loyalty. When, you know, when you're the person that can say, that, when a person can say that person right there is the one that take care of me, and it's a man or a woman, that person take good care of me. They've always looked out for me. They gave me a way to take care of my responsibilities, to have a home, to pay my bills, to have my nice little car. It's because of this person. You get a lot of loyalty. And that's one of the reasons why we don't find black people being so heavily loyal to our race, because we're not the ones feeding each other. Black people cannot control the social order of our community if we don't control the business infrastructure. Hey, you want to you wanna stop crime in your community? You can't stop crime if you don't own the businesses. You think the police going to stop crime in the black community? No, nah, that's how the police got a job. If there's no crime in your community that he can come in, he can't catch all the criminals because if he catches the criminals, there'll be no more crime. He got to let them commit the crime. You call him, he come, write a report or do something or another, and then go around and harass the non-criminals in your community and not catch the criminals so they can create another crime so they can call him and he can keep his job. No, you know how you stop crime in your community? You got to have business infrastructure. And what do you do? If you got young people that's out of control and robbing and stealing, you put some money together with the business and start a community center. Now you got them. You got the young people going to the community center. You got activities. They see you. You do your little advertising in the community center. They start to like you. They'll police your community. They'll say, nah, don't mess with that, that, that shop over there. Those people take care of us. It's, it's not even that hard. If you want to stop uh, all the alcoholism in your community, all you got to do is get a group of black businesses together. If y'all run y'all community and you open up Alcohols Anonymous right next to the liquor store. And then, you, not only you do that, you put money together and you start creating problems for the liquor store. You get the politicians in your pocket, look, we don't want this liquor store over here. Give them a little something, you know, y'all black business people say, look, we want this thing out of here. And before you know it, the black liquor store got all kind of liens and all kind of issues and he find another place to go. And now the alcohol's gone. Now you got the Alcohols Anonymous helping your people get off of that, but you gotta have businesses. Without that business infrastructure, you had the same crime or worse because ultimately that person that's committing crime gonna come to you and say, what can you do for me? If you can't give them a job, you can't make their life better in any way, shape or form, they're gonna turn right back to crime. Black people need black businesses to finance our progress in this country and the world. 
every community around the world that's decided that it wants to do something about its condition finances its own change. Nobody finances the struggle of any oppressed people but that oppressed people. We are an oppressed people for those that don't know in America. We don't think we are, but we are. The only way we're going to get out of this condition is to get our own businesses, find a way to capture that black dollar, and then turn it into something that can help our own communities. And lastly, black business creates stability, growth, resources, and promise for the black community. One of the problems we have is that there's no longevity. We can't plan anything because our businesses turn over so fast and everybody else owns some of the community. The way you're supposed to be able to do it is if you have a community that you own and control, you got a black brother, he does, uh, he does shoes. He does, you know, he takes care of people's shoes. Well, he grooming people. Well, those young people he grooming, they're not gonna take care of shoes in 20 years. They're gonna have a shoe manufacturing plant. So that place that the, the brother started, there was a shoe uh, repair shop. In 20, 30 years, his sons, his son's friends, those people that came up in his business now have bought the business. Now they got a place where they make shoes and they, and they send them and, and ship them all around the country. And then the grandchildren that come from that, now they on a whole nother level. Now they getting uh, cows and farms to get to make the leather to produce it. Now it's a whole nother. But see, the problem with the black community is that we don't have enough business infrastructure to plan beyond the next five years because black businesses struggle to stay alive so much. So are we clear on why black businesses are important? We clear? All right. Then let's move on into this. Y'all don't mind. We're going we gonna, to uh, let Amos Wilson talk to us as well uh, uh, during the course of this. You know, this is one of our ancestors that passed recently. Peace be upon him. One of the greatest black psychologists of our time. And one of the things Brother Amos Wilson is going to talk about right here very uh, shortly. And we're going to have some more clips as we go through. But he talks to us about the importance of providing jobs for our own people and how important jobs and business is to the black community. The world of miseducation. Joblessness, only about 20% of them are working. And jobs and work are a part of people's self-definition. It stabilizes society. It stabilizes the relationship between people. It defines their relationship and stabilizes communities and so forth. When you have people who are not working and people who do not have jobs and people who are insecure about their job, it destabilizes families and communities and ethnic groups. Jobs are the means by which people become disciplined and discipline and organize their behavior and organize themselves. All right, so y'all with me? We all on the same page here today? All right, then we're on the same page. Then we're going to really get into the discussion because we set it up now, but we got to really talk about it. Let's get right down to the meat, what we want to talk about. Start right here at the beginning. Most black businesses fail within their first year. Let's start talking about some of the things that are responsible for black business failure. Start off one, very often black people get into business for the wrong reasons. Let's just talk about a couple of the wrong reasons that we get into business. One of them. We want to be the boss. Got to be in charge. <laughs> How many times have you seen a new black business and you walk in, and as soon as you walk in the door, you see some guy barking at you, do this and do that. You get in a little disagreement. I mean, something mild. And this is my store. You can't be here. It's like, look, man, we see, brother, you made a little bit of money. You was able to get your nice little storefront. But you're not here to do business. You're here so you can be in control. Got sisters working and if he can't get his way with the sister, then he want to threaten to fire. Well, I'll I fire you then if you don't want to do it. I mean, we've been so powerless for so long that brothers and sisters are getting to a business, and instead of trying to do good business, the only thing they want to do is be able to bark and yell at people, and that's why they got so much turnover because, you know, black folks, we might take that for some white folks, but we ain't going to take that from each other. You ain't going to be barking and yelling at us for too long before we're going to walk. And so we got a lot of people that get into business simply out of powerlessness to be in charge and be in control and dominate over people, and almost invariably, it never works. They run their, their employees away, and they run their customers away. Another one. It's a big one, too. Brother, been talking for years. For the last 10 years, this brother real passionate, man. I'm going to start me a barbershop one day. I'm going to do it. He got his dream. And everybody listening to him and his brother, they're not paying him any attention. They're like, yeah, whatever. And finally, he gets him a little spot. Gets him a couple of his boys that he's been, been selling his dream to. He put all his hard money together. He started a barbershop. Next thing you know, people in the neighborhood are like, man, we're proud to see you doing this. They coming in. 
he doing well. Ain't six months for some Negro around the corner who ain't never in a million years thought about having no barber shop. But that Negro was sitting there listening to him all those years, had money, could have helped him, could have took, well, I ain't helping this, you know what? Now all of a sudden his brother's doing well, and this jealous Negro, six doors down, don't even give him like a few blocks, six doors down, he take his money and buy a bigger building and start him a barber shop because he want to compete with that man because he got a barber shop. Didn't think that, well, you know, barbers, it's a lot of barber shops around. What is it that barbers need that I can go into business providing now both of us can make? No, 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 we're not in it to compete with other groups of people or to build infrastructure. We get in business to compete with another black person that got in business, and then we end up doing damage to both of them, and both of them end up folding. And that's a major problem with a lot of our black businesses, why they don't survive, because they get in the business not for the purpose, the best purpose, of getting in business is to help your race or your community. The best reason for a black person to get in business, now getting in business to make money, another excellent reason. That's what business is for. But the best reason is to help your community because you will stay centered and you will always be doing things that are good for your community, which means those people who are looking for life in your community will always be able to come to you and support you. Another reason black businesses fail, low performance standards. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Open and late, and closing early. Y'all know what I'm talking about, man. You know, you got, you know, you get the new place that's open. They make, you know, they got the fish shop. They make the fresh fish sandwiches. You love that sandwich. You're trying to convince your man, because you know, your man like to go to Eddie Leonard's. He like going to the Asians, but you're trying to get them off. You want them to support the black business. You looking at the clock, y'all getting off work early today. Now you're 45 minutes away. The place closed at 5 o'clock. It's 4:30. So you say, we're going to have to step on the gas to get over there. So you running red lights, cutting people off, driving like crazy so you can get your man. Now you trying to go show them how good this sandwich is at this black-owned business. They're closing. What time? Five o'clock. See, y'all late. Y'all black, too, so y'all understand. <laughs> what time they supposed to close? Five o'clock. So you driving. You 45 minutes away. And you only got half an hour, but you pull up in there. At 4.59 with 30 seconds, you don't even park in the space. You just stop right in the middle. People beeping at you. You get out of my way. You running in there. You run to the door. And I know y'all have had this happen to you before. You grab and turn it, and it don't turn. You're like, nah, they're not doing this to me. You're like, nah, it's 4.59. I got 30 seconds. You know, what's up? And you turn it, and it's closed. You're like, come on, man. I done drove halfway across town. Speeding over here trying to do it. And then, you know, you see the cat in the back because they closing up. And you knock, oh, you see him. You're like, maybe I got some life, right? You're like, hey, what's up? What's up? He like, no, nah, no, nah, we closed. You're like, no, nah, it's 5 o'clock. He wait a few seconds. No, nah, it's 5.01 it's now. You can't, he say, come on, man. He come to the door, what? He said, man, look, I came halfway across town. I just want, want my man to get this sandwich and everything. No, nah, no, nah, we shut down early today. You know, they got a game. We want to uh, check it out. You're like, yeah, I shut down early. Well, do y'all got any sandwiches left or anything? I mean, anything, bro. No, no, we ain't got nothing. Come back tomorrow. All right, click, click. You got that depressed feeling. And then the worst thing, you know, he probably going to come out there. Instead of giving it to you, you know, he ready to leave early. But he got two fish sandwiches in the bag, and he take one out. And on his way to the car, he eating it to the fish sandwich. So you like, you know what? How many times are you going to go back to that store? You're not going to come back. Are you going to convince your man? Because your man in the car waiting for you, you say, look, man, we can always go to Eddie Leonard's. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they open. The Asians open to 12. Brothers and sisters, this is how people take lateness. They feel disrespected. It doesn't matter if that's what you intend to do. And I know as a race of people, we're not the same as Europeans about time, but we ain't in Africa. We're not in ancient African times. We in America today. If you're not open on time or if you close before you say you're supposed to close, your black customers feel disrespected. You don't waste their time, their energy, and they're going to stop coming and supporting you. You got to do this thing. If you can't open at 9, then put 9.15 as the opening time. And get there before 9.15 so the doors will be open on time. That's one of the, the, one of the worst things black people want to see when your hours are still up. Sorry we closed. Some other things we do, and I know some brothers and sisters here, you know what I'm talking about. You've been to a black-owned business, particularly some of the newer ones with people who obviously want to do business but have not learned, you know, the customer service aspect. You walk out, you feel like you want to just, you just want to yell at the top of your lungs. Some of the 
basic consistent things we do in business that will drive somebody away from your business, inconsistency. Big, uh, Jamaican restaurants are known for that. Whatever it is that you like that's on the menu, they never got it. So you get to the restaurant, you say, look, I want that roti. Oh, no roti today. He said, all right. Well, all right, look, give me the oxtails. No oxtails. All, all we got today is the curry chicken. <laughs> Why you ain't tell me that when I walked in? You're going to let me go through the list and tell me that. It's a, but it, it's serious for black business. One thing that black people expect, whatever it is they like, they want it to be there at the same price to taste the same way every time they come. Consistency. Disrespect. How many times you come into the, to the new spot and a brother sitting there, you know how the brother do, he's sitting there reading his paper. You walk in all excited, oh, it's a black on, okay, let me check it out. You look at him, he look at you. He look back at his paper, you go, oh, come on now. You can't say hello, good morning, nothing. You know what you're going to do, you're going to walk around and you're going to take that little disrespect, you're going to look at a couple things, you're going to turn right back around and walk right out the door. I don't know what it is about us, but we, 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 we like owning stuff but we don't like showing people that we appreciate them giving us their hard-earned money. If the Asians who hate us can smile and grin and learn our names and smile, why can't we treat our people with the same kind of courtesy? No humility. Man, I bet how many people here know what I'm talking about? You've been to a black-owned spot, but you'll go there, but you know that you can't have any type of conflict because you know that the person that's working there is not going to admit that they made a mistake. Has anybody ever experienced that? All right. So you go to a black owned uh, 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 any type of business and you go there. Let's say you went there's a little corner store and you got some spoiled milk. You bring you come back two or three days later. Hey, look, man, you know, last time I came here, I had some spoiled milk. Now, you know, it's a black consumer. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You don't even want to say it because you like I know I'm going to lose this relationship. I want to like and keep coming here, but he supposed to do the right thing. But you know what happens? We don't have no humility. So there's two ways you can handle it. The way we handle it, and the way we're supposed to handle it, the way we handle it. The black owned business, oh, you got some spoiled milk. Why didn't you call me when, when it did? How long ago was that? That was three days ago. So now you combative with a person that's coming to your store that you did something wrong. You fighting with them over something you did wrong. Well, look, man, I'm just saying, well, well go, ahead, go ahead and get another one if that's what you want to do. They, they mistreating you now for bringing it up. So now you're like, you know what? Don't even worry about it. It's not about, about the money. You don't like being disrespected. How should you handle it? Think about it. We all the same. If the man bought some milk or the woman bought some milk, you know how they found out it was spoiled? They took their cereal out, they poured it in a bowl, they right ready to eat, and they poured some spoiled milk in. Now you done wasted their cereal. They might have been trying to make a meal that night, make some fish or whatever they need. So you done gave them some spoiled, so whatever they was trying to do, they've been inconvenienced. They had to come all the way back here to tell you, you should feel like if you're a good business person, the last memory you want a person to have is a positive memory about you. If you let them leave out of there feeling like they had to challenge you and fight you to, for you to do them right, they're not coming back. What you should do is say, hey, look, go ahead and get, uh, go get another thing of milk right there. And look, whatever else you got around there, give them something on the house. Say, we apologize for that, man. I, I hate when that kind of thing happens. That's not how we do business here. And anytime you have a problem, just come back and tell me. Why? Because now you made him whole. You gave him what he got wrong last time. Then on top of that, for his inconvenience or her inconvenience or what they went through, you threw something else out there to say, hey, look, we do good business here. Now, the last thing they remember about you is giving them something free. And if you want some loyalty and appreciation from black people, you throw them something free, you got it. Let's have some humility when we go into business. It's about making money. It's not about trying to be in boss. Cleanliness. I don't need to say no more about that. You're not gonna, black people are not coming back if your place is not clean. Pushing your politics. You got to know how to push your politics. Your politics are on your wall. It's your spot. You can put anything you want on your wall. That's the end of your politics. If somebody asks you your opinion on something and you develop relationships with your clientele to talk about politics, that's fine. But sometimes we get into a situation where we're in business and forgetting what business is about. They want a good or service. I got the good or service. Let's exchange those and let me let that person go about their way happy with their good or service. I don't have to turn that person into my religion. I don't have to turn that person to my political position. I don't have to do any of that. Let them get their goods or service and make that move and go to the next place. Shortcutting, you know, restaurants do it all the time. Black owned restaurant, they only got enough for a half order of fries, which means he don't have enough for any fries. If he give them to you for free, he'll tell you he can't sell them to you. But they gonna give you the half order and stack it so it looks like it's full, like you dumb enough when you get home, you're not gonna open it up and realize that they skimmed you. And people don't understand, those little shortcuts 
It might be you might have made that extra two or three dollars that day, but you lost a customer. Cause what they gonna do? They gonna say, man, I'm not going there, man. They, they skipping me on on the food. And what they gonna do? When the next person asks them, what about that place? Word of mouth. Nah, man. They man, they they, they rob you, give you half stuff. Then that's gonna turn that person off. And before you know it, you're gonna start losing clientele because of shortcutting, overcharging. We know that black owners have to pay more to get their stuff, but some black owned businesses try to make their profit off of each sale. That's not how you make profit. You sell volume. That's how you make your money. Poor listening skills. Just arrogant. You know, just an arrogant business owner. Don't listen. The, time, the way you're going to learn as a black owned business entrepreneur, the way you're going to learn most about what's going on, on out there in the world, because you're busy doing your business. The way you're going to learn about what's new is through your customers. Listen to them. They go out, they buy stuff other places. If there's new technology coming, if anything's going, they're going to tell you. If something is wrong with your spot or something is good about your spot, they'll tell you. But if you're not listening to them, then you won't know. Chronic lateness, we just talked about that. That's serious for black. Tech dinosaurs. This is 2011. If you don't have a way to accept credit cards in your black business, something is wrong. There's no excuse for that right at this time. And a lot of black businesses get old and they die out because they get old and don't know how to stay relevant. Uh, don't question their customers. We just talked about that. Don't care about losing a customer. If you're in business, the people that keep you in business are your customers. That's your lifeline. The black owned business person can be so arrogant, they are not thinking about losing a customer. Every other race of people, no matter how much they hate your guts, they want your green dollars. And even if they wrong, they'll go the extra mile not to lose that customer because it's not one sale you lose with that customer. It's them and everybody that they know who would listen to them and come to your business. The use of language, real important. Black people don't realize this. When you're in business, in the black community, you are what we call a dignitary. Black people in don't think that way, but the reality of it is, it's not that many black owned businesses in our communities. And when we see people who own businesses, we don't look at them as just like regular everyday black people. When we see them in the streets, they're somebody. They're somebody important, which means even though your customers might use filthy language and curse and use the N word, even in your store, they might do that and you might, you might even allow that. They don't expect that from you. And it's an unspoken rule that most black people don't know. They expect you to carry yourself like the dignitary. They expect you to carry yourself like a head of state. Somebody with dignity and respect to dress a certain way and speak a certain way, whether you're in your business or out of your business. No matter what area of business you're doing, they expect you to be better than everybody else. And you should carry that and remember that because that's part of why they come there. You make black people feel good when you in business and doing well and doing good business because it says that we can succeed as people. When you forget that, you can turn off a serious customer who you didn't realize was not just buying from you because of your product, but like the way you carry yourself and how dignified you were. And last, we don't have a backup plan. A lot of times we don't have the resources to have it, but those are just some of the things. We're talking about low performance standards with the black owned business. Y'all still with me? Uh, we're going to turn it up a little bit as we go. Poor business ethic. We're going we to get a little deeper into this thing. We're going to talk about some history, but right now we just want to we want to make sure we started off with some practical things that we know what's going on in our community, that black businesses can look at themselves and say, hey, we can do this a little different. The business ethics. Man, let me tell you something. <laughs> there was a time in the black community, if you was going to get a plumber, if you were going to get an electrician, if you were going to get any home improvement, if you were going to get any brickwork done, the only person you would call was a black man. Because you knew that brother was going to take good care of it. If you were going to get laundry done, if you're going to get any type of uh, service that a sister would do, you're going to call a sister. You'll get your house clean because you know we were going to do it better than anybody else, and we stood on our work. And if you called a black person who had done work for you, now we're talking about back in the day. I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about in the 1950s and 60s. They would run over there to see what it is you thought they did wrong, and even if they didn't do anything wrong, they'd just take it, care of it on the house because it was their name. The character and the ethics of our people was intact. We cared about our work because it was who we were. We were proud and productive people. Today, I just got to be honest. Even myself, I'm going to be honest. Having dealt with repeated, lousy, unethical black business people, certain types of work, I take a real quick glance to see if there's anybody black that can do it, and I'm running to the Hispanics. I'm going to tell you why. Not that I want to do that, but the reality of it is, let's face it, the Hispanics have developed a reputation 
through their ethics. They don't steal. So you ain't even thinking about if you have some Hispanics in your house that they go steal. It don't even cross your mind. You got to really think about it. These are not black people. These are not folks that we see every day. What have they done that makes them so reliable that you don't even think people will go on the side of the road and pick up some Hispanics. It never crosses your mind that they're going to rob you or that they're going to bring some crew back to your house at a later date. You don't even think about that. You know they're going to work hard. They're going to charge you a reasonable price. And you're not going to catch them slacking on the job and hiding stuff. They're going to tell you, hey, this is an extra piece. I'll do it for this amount. They're going to be ethical. We are not like that anymore. I'm going to tell this story. I know I told it before, but it, 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 it's a real story. And it kind of exemplifies what we're talking about. Now, I've had some horrible experiences with black uh, businesses, but I've had some good ones too. But I had kind of a, a, a series of bad ones. And the final straw, my mother called me. Now, this is my real mother now. Woman gave me birth, called me up, look. I went out to get some work done, $1,700 worth of work done, my mother. I'm like, Mom, why didn't you call me? I would got somebody over there. Well, I, look, I'm calling you now. I did it. And the brother now is not coming to finish the work. He did a terrible job, and he left all the trash outside, and he won't pick up the phone. So, you know, brother's like, oh, nah, not $1,700. Not mom. Not the mother. You're not going to do my mother like that. So I said, well, who is this dude? So she told me who he was. I looked him up or whatever. And she called me one day. Now, this fool, I want y'all to understand when I'm talking about poor ethics in our people. This fool was a rock throw away of the house next door. Like, at the curb right there on the street, that's where the house is from where my mother lived. This fool was up there doing work for them people. Won't return her calls, got trash all on the side of her house. She called me up. Here you go. He over here right now, right in front of me. I said, okay, go in the house. You don't want to be out there. So I drive around there. I was like, I know how I'm going to do with this. Because I know how these guys, how you deal with these kind of cats. You can't talk to them. So I'm walking up to the cat. I know exactly how I'm going to handle it. And it was perfect, too, because he had been doing so much work. He was real tired and sweating. I said, oh, this guy really picked a bad day. And trying to be a black man. No, I wasn't even trying to be a black man. I ain't going to lie. I was just going to go up to him and do what I had to do, you know, make sure he understand what, what he had done. And he's going to get this taken care of. $1,700. It's my mother. Before I got to the dude, I don't know if my mother had already talked to her about me. She talked to people about me a lot or whatever, but he saw me. He said, wait a minute, hey, brother, brother. He said, you, you, miss, uh, you miss Easter Sun? I said, yeah. But, you know, I ain't trying to talk to him too much because, you know, when brothers know they're doing you wrong, they try to talk to you and get me. I said, nah, dude, it's not going to go down like that today. So I said, yeah, uh-huh. Oh, no, let me, hold on. Before you go any further, let me tell you. He said, brother, he said, I like the fact you over here stand up for your mother. That's what a brother's supposed to do. In my mind, I'm like, you're not getting me with none of this, dude. This, this is going down the same way. So he started talking, and it was my fault. Something just said, hit the dude. Don't stop. Don't even, don't listen to no more of this. Go ahead, smack this dude upside his head. Let him understand the real. But trying to be black power, good, decent black man, I'm letting this bama talk. Thinking, ain't nothing you're going to say going to change my mind. I'm still going to go upside your head. Then he started talking. And I swear, this is a weird thing, because I don't talk to black people who do this. He, all this brother, brother, brother. You know how brothers don't talk using the word brother. This fool said, Man, you know, the white man got his foot on my neck, and, you know, I'm trying to go out here and work on my own, and, and now they're trying to take my customers from me, and, you know, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be a brother. You know, they, they, they try to keep us down, so, you know, you know, I'm not showing him, I'm just looking at him, but on the inside, I'm like, man, you know, why do do be doing that to us, brother? I feel you, you know. Then he really got me. Y'all sisters going to get mad at me on this one, but you know where he really got me. And, man, and my wife... She's supposed to be on my side, but she, she might as well be working for the white man. She don't believe in me. I'm like, babe, if you believe in me, then we can do something together. I can do something for myself. So on the outside, I'm just looking at him like this. On the inside, I'm like, man, oh, he got me, man. He got me, man. So I'm like this. Then he hit me with the bomb shit. This is where he really broke me. Yeah, man, I'm impotent now. I can't even sleep with my wife, man. I'm like, dang. I ain't never had no brother tell me nothing like that. Like, that's real personal. So I still, I didn't, like, show him. Well, on the inside, I said, okay, I ain't going to smack him because I knew where he lived anyway, right? So I was like, I know where you live anyway, so okay, I'm going to give him another chance. I said, well, look, he talked to all these here. I said, well, all right, that's, that's your business. My mother lived right there. I said, you got a week? He said, no, nah, listen, you ain't even got to do it like that. Next Friday, tell your mother, figure out which hotel she wants to stay in. I know we messed the house up and all that stuff. I'm going to take care of everything, brother. We, I ain't going to do your mother like that. Look, next Friday, all you got to do, which hotel she want to be at. I'm going to give her $200. I can't do more than $200. I need two full days. Bro, we're going to have a spot. It's going to be perfect. I promise you, my brother. I would not do you. I appreciate the way you're looking out for your mother. But thank you, brother. 
So I walk away. And some of me told me, man, you should just steal him just for good measure, just so he know he going to get hit. But I didn't do it. Man, Wednesday came. I thought I was a victim. My mother called me. Oh, I, hey, he done moved all the stuff from the side of the house. You must have talked to him. I'm sitting back here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what it is. I think I got it all done. So Saturday, I'm calling her. He done moved all the stuff from the house. So I'm like, yeah, well, he going to do it this weekend. So Saturday, I'm calling her on the cell phone thinking that she at a hotel somewhere. So I'm like, hey, Ma, what's up? She's like, why you coming on the cell phone? I'm at the house. I'm like, Nah, nah, I know I want to say it ain't so, but I don't want to lie to you. I was like, nah, Joe. I said, but, but what about the guy? Nah, she said, nah, he's not calling now. I said, oh. And I could hear her disappointment was not with him. You know how I'm supposed to take care of it? You can kind of hear she. My mother not going to say it's my fault, but that's how I'm feeling. I'm really in my feelings. So I said, all right, hop on the ride. He live on B Street, Marshall Heights, dude. I know where you at. I didn't tell him that. I figured I had it under control. Walking around B Street, it's like 6, 7 o'clock, you know, I'm going around there. I know how this going to go. I walk around. You know that same feeling you get when you go to the black-owned business and it's locked? I get around and his door is halfway cracked open. And something told me this is not good, man. Man, I open that door. <laughs> man, that thing been vacuumed. Ain't as much as a piece of toilet paper in the place. It's completely empty. Dude walk around going, yeah, he done gone to Baltimore. I see. <laughs> And I remember he was talking about Baltimore, but I didn't think it was going to happen in a week, seven days, you know. So now I got to go home to my mother and tell her she's not going to get none of this stuff done. And I'm going to find this cat in Baltimore somewhere. I ain't going to do it, man. To this day, I'm like, look, ain't no statute of limitations on stealing from my mother, you know. But I don't know where to do this. My point, man, how many times can you go through this kind of stuff? That's $1,700, and she never got the work done. Every time I go over there, I see it. How many times do you take this kind of stuff from your own people, praying on you because you black, knowing that you give them a pass before our sisters and brothers start saying, you know what, man, I love my people, but not that much. Not enough to let them kill me and disappoint me over and over again. We start going to work with other people. And that's, I told that story because that's really is in for how we feel as people. We constantly getting beat down by our own people and it make us hesitant to even want to go support black-owned businesses, we got to change the ethics in our community. We are not, we don't have fathers in the home. Fathers do not let their children grow up not taking pride in what they do. That discipline is not there, and it translates into business, and it translates into substantial numbers of millions of dollars that run right out of the black community simply because we don't have people that stand by their word and do good work. And so other communities take our work, and they leave us feeling like we're going crazy. We're going to get a little deeper in it now. We're going to talk about another thing we don't do. We don't work together and we're not exclusive. Again, we look at each other. Everything is a war. And I want you to pay close attention because if you look close enough, you see who's in the middle. Who's in the middle right there? That's right. You see the white male standing right there? He's in the middle making the most money. But who is the star attraction? The brothers. And that's how our community works. It, if it, the way it's supposed to work, if they the star attraction and who everybody paying to see, they should say, well, guess what? Every one of us know we grew up with some brothers that knew how to instigate. That's all this white guy is, is an instigator. Oh, it's going to be a fight. You got to be. We had Cats, man, PJ, and Corky I grew up with. They can instigate better than any white boy you can put in that ring. Why, if they the main attraction and they the reason why people coming, it's not everybody at this ringside that's making money why they ain't black. They not black because we so busy being in competition with each other that we don't think about it and we don't exclude other people. We want to be love everybody, bring everybody in there. But guess what? This is how it's supposed to work. See, this is how business is supposed to work. You got a barbershop and then you realize there's 30 barbershops around town. Instead of trying to compete with your own brother and open up a barbershop, you're supposed to say, well, look, they pay a certain price for the stuff they get because they buy singly. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go around to all the black barbershops. I'm going to say, look, what's the stuff y'all get? I'm going to take their inventory and I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to start a distribution center. I'm going to buy the stuff at wholesale. I'm going to sell it to y'all at a lower price. So you can get a better price and you can get personalized service. Anytime you need something, call me. I'm going to get a little catalog and give you what you need. So what ends up happening, another black person goes into business and that person now can make an independent living and all of the black barbers pay cheaper prices
for their inventory so everybody wins. Why we won't do it? Because the black barber don't want to see this. You know what we want to call ourselves? Don't look at us, my brother. You want to see your brother independent? Nah, we don't want to see him independent. I got to come here and cut hair every day. Why should he be able to be out there be independent? So we so busy competing, foreigners are coming in and taking all of the wealth out of our community. But guess what? Asians don't work like that. That's what you call unity right there. You know how they do it? The Asians do it like this. They got corner stores and they pay 50 cent for a soda and they sell it for a dollar. They say, you know what? We making 50 cent on every soda. Guess what? We gonna put an Asian in business to do distribution. Since we got 40 corner stores around here, look here, they bring their Asian friends, we gonna put the money up for you. Buy the sodas. He go out, buy all the sodas for all 40 business, he get them for 10 cent a pop. Sell it to them for 30 cent a pop. So now they done made a man make more money than any of them, cause he doing distribution for all of them. He making more money than all of them. And where they used to sell a soda for a dollar and make 50 cent, now they making 70 cent on every soda. And you still buying them sodas because they still cheap and inexpensive. You don't realize how much money making. You don't care. You know how much it costs you. But they done put their brother in business. And they keep doing that and putting their own people in business and saving money and building wealth. Because they not competing with each other. They competing with us. We don't get it. Who does get it? The Arabs get it. With their OPEC and their oil stuff, they get it. The small hats, the white so-called Jews, they really get it. I mean, they keep everything in house. They not subcontract. They getting every dollar that can be got, and, and they squeezing a dollar out of a nickel. They getting everything. <laughs> the Indians, they not going around asking black people, hey, let's go to business together. No. They out there unified and exclusive. Nobody else can get in. And even the Hispanic community, I'm really, I know our people get jealous and mad because we see them, the descendants of the Native Americans, getting up and doing for themselves. Why are we mad at them? Because they doing what we refuse to do. They taking our job. No, we giving our jobs away. We not working hard. We don't want to come to work on time. We don't have good ethics. So they can come in and under, un, undersell us because of us, not because of them. Don't get mad at the next man that's doing for himself. Get mad at yourself for not being exclusive and doing for your own community. That's our problem. And I'm going to say this. This is going to offend some people, but, you know, we don't come here to be your friend. We came here to save you. So we're going to tell you the truth. One of the main problems with black business around the world is that we have been so thoroughly Christianized that we believe we should give our stuff to everybody else other than our own people. We will not be exclusive and say, I don't care what religion I believe in. I'm black and I'm going to look out for my brother and my sister and ain't nobody else getting in. We need to implement a law. This should be an unwritten law that is a universal law. And understand what I'm saying? We have to do business across racial lines sometimes. Sometimes you got to buy goods from somebody else because they're the only ones that have them. But in our internal infrastructure, where we sit down and organize to build wealth for our community, whether it's institutions or organizations, Dr. Chancellor Williams told us this, even civilizations and nations, the key element in the destruction of black civilization has been integration. Every time we marry other people outside our race, every time we bring in all these other folks, all they do is siphon off the wealth and the prosperity of our community like culture bandits, take it, and then we end up with nothing. We end up with nothing. We should have a law, unspoken but universally practiced. In our internal infrastructure, anytime somebody suggests that we invite somebody into the inner circle of whatever we're doing, that is not black, they should have a permanent ban right. from the infrastructure. Meaning if we got a group of, no, I'm serious, listen, I want you to hear what I'm saying. If we start in a, black, a group of black businesses, right, a group of brothers who do construction, they come together and say, okay, we're going to do construction. And one of them says, hey, look, man, I know a, 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 a Hispanic guy uptown, he got some business, we'll see if we can work with him to get some contracts. That's cool. Yeah, you're going to talk to him out there, see if you can help us get in to get some of that money. But if that person said, yeah, we need to bring him to our table. We say, brother, we appreciate you coming through. We're going to ask you to leave now. Never, ever come back to this table. In fact, this table doesn't exist, as far as you're concerned. Love you, brother. We appreciate you. We'll see you on the battlefield. Get on out. And, and I'm serious. I know y'all think it's a joke. I'm very serious. Anything that we're doing, if it's an organization for self-help, all of a sudden it starts off black, black people getting excited. A person like me, 
First time I come, you got a bunch of gay white boys out there talking about, yeah, uh, free somebody. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I believe in the cause, but not that much. I'm not doing it. You run away to strong black people by inviting all these other people. We didn't come there for that. We came there to look at our brothers and sisters and help them. We need to have a permanent ban on integrationism in our internal infrastructure, and it should be across the board, and it should be serious, permanent, meaning you can't apologize for it. Once you've done it, you've committed the crime that destroys our civilizations. We're not telling you you can't come to the stores we build, but you won't be part of making them. I know, I know, that's kind of hard. Some people say, hold up now. Yeah, we, hey, we got to talk business. It's about money. You can't make money when you let everybody in. You got to close the door sometime. What better way to close the door than close them on everybody that's not black? Here we go. What else is going on? We're going to get a little deeper now. We're going to keep stepping deeper now, so we're going to keep moving deeper into it. One of the things that's a problem is that we don't understand the psychology of the black consumer. The black consumer, all consumers are not the same. These people come into our doors, and the vast majority of black businesses are servicing who? Black people. Brothers and sisters who got money and want to spend that money. But if you don't know what are the child, what is this man thinking? He got his son, man. What, what's going on with that man? You know, all these brothers out here getting talked about like they're not good fathers and he wants to be a good father. What's driving your consumer that's coming into your store that you need to know that you make sure you don't make bad decisions when they come in the gig? Because look, we got some money. Y'all know, look at it. We flashing it everywhere we go. Black folks got money. Look at the shoes we wearing. Look at the shirts we wearing. The brothers might be wearing little tiny women's skinny jeans, but I bet you they cost some good money. They not free. Skinny as they may be, as little thread as they got in them, but they got to pay for those things. But let me tell you something. One of the things we don't do is we don't understand. The black business person is the primary psychologist in the black community. Let me tell you, when you go, most brothers go to the barber shop. The barber shop they end up staying at is the one that got that kind of dialogue that they like to hear. Let's keep it real. The barber shop that a brother ends up staying at, not going to, but the one he stay at and go to regularly, that's the barber shop where they be kicking the kind of stuff he wants to hear. And his barber is not just a guy that cuts his hair. It's the brother he talked to and asked questions. He gets advice from. He give advice to, and they talk. Sisters. When they go to the hairdresser, the hairdresser probably know more about them women in there than many of their husbands. Why? Because the black-owned business is a place where black people can be black, talk about the stuff that's on our mind, we can disagree, and for some reason we generally know how to do it without it becoming a fight in business infrastructure. We got to understand that. So the black-owned business person got to understand who they servicing that's coming through their doors. So let's just talk a little bit about the psychology of the black person that comes through the doors in the black community. First of all, there's only three things that people are thinking if you're a new black business and they black. Three general things they're thinking when they come in. One, you got a consumer who comes in and saying, man, it's a black owned business. I'm trying to spend my money here. That's the, the only thing they care about is black owned business. All you got to do to get that consumer is treat them right. The only reason they coming in is not because it's a new store, because it's black. And they just want something black they can be proud of. All you got to do with that person is very simple. You can take care of them. Then you got the second person. That's the exact opposite. They believe that in words ain't this, that, and the other. They have a very negative opinion of black people. They've probably been burned by black people their whole life. They only coming into your store to prove that it ain't you know what. That's the only reason they coming in there. You can keep that person as a customer too. I'm going to tell you how. And then you got a third person. They want a good of service. The store right there is convenient to them. They walking in. They don't care color, race, creed. They're looking for what they want. They're going to come to get it. You give it to them. They happy. They come back next time. If not, they won't. How do you deal with those three people? Very similarly. But let me just give you a slight nuance. You got the sister who walking into the store. All she doing is trying to support black business. She walks in new, walk in the door, look in the door. How you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? How you doing, sister? You know, speak to her. How you doing? Glad you come in. You know, we just opened the store. I heard about it. I, I want to come, you know, support my own. You already indicated, okay, this is why she here. She wants to support her own people. She come up, well, look, I need a pair of batteries, you know. Do you got uh, Energizer? Well, all I got is door sale. You don't just let her walk out the door. She's like, oh, I use Energizer. Well, look, how often do you buy them? Remember I said before, we don't talk to our customers? How often do you buy batteries? This is something you get in one time or? No, no, I buy them every day because I do X, Y, Z. Well, look, let me do this. This Monday. They give you two packs, a pack for the day, a pack for tomorrow. 
on Wednesday, I start, I had the energized in here. And from then on, you can just come right here and get them whenever you need them. I'm telling you something. The person that wants to spend money with you because you black, when you make that, they're going to buy that. They're going to go outside of what they normally do because they want to support you. And you done step and put a step foot forward and told them you're going to have it. All you got to do to lock that customer in is on Wednesday when that sister come back, if you got her energizer batteries there ready for her, ready, it's done. She is a, a full-time customer. You ain't done Holly nothing but just be there, and she's going to spend her money with you every time she because that's why she came in the door in the first place. Other cat, a little different. He coming in the door because he wants to say why he ain't going to buy nothing. You got to learn. It's a little balance. You can't kowtow to him because then he'll mistreat you and think he can walk over you. At the same time, you don't give him no reason to justify walking out your door. So he come in and, you got such and such? And so you hear him talking to you like they say, okay, here one of these dudes. You know who you're dealing with already. Yes, sir, brothers, right there on the counter. You got him. He, he thinking you don't have it. Oh, oh, oh you charge this about it. Cost that much down the street. It is 20. You know, he talking to you all kind of way. All you do is be polite to him. Say, I understand that, brother. But, we, you know, we just starting up. We're going to do our best. We're going to drop those prices as soon as we start getting some turnover, brother. So we appreciate it if you support us. I don't know if I can do this and everything like that. You just chill out. Let him do, let him do all of his stuff and make his decision what he's going to do. I'm going to tell you the truth, a little secret. If you navigate that well, that person's going to be your longest customer. I'm going to tell you why. What's really going on with that person, they hate black people. They hate themselves. They hate what they've seen black people do to them. But deep down inside, the only reason they came in your store, deep down somewhere in them, they want somebody to prove them wrong. What's going to happen is they're going to keep coming back to your store to prove that you ain't right. And every time that you write <laughs> and you do them good in business, you're going to start chipping away at that hatred they got for black business. And what's going to end up happening is going to be your longest term customer. They're going to be the one that's there the longest. And when you're not around, they ain't going to never say it to you. When you're not around, though, this is how they're going to talk about your business. Now, see, they know how to run a business. And the rest of these, you know what, don't know how to do business. That's how you should do it. They're going to be singing your praises because you're making them heal from all of the bad business that black people have done to them in the past. Then you got your third customer that walk in the door. This person don't care nothing about race or nothing like that. They just want the best price. Since you don't have the best price, you got to be a psychologist. Look, young brother come in. Look, mom, y'all got Arizona IC. Yes, sir, young brother's right there in the back. Now, you already know yours is $1.20. The, the, the Asian got it for 89 cent. That's 40 cent there, 30 cent. I, you know, I can't count. That's not what we're here. We're not here to count. We're here to talk about black business. Let Koi count. Koi got a count up there, all right? <laughs> but look. The young go there, going to the store, he gonna pick it up. Oh man, this thing 129, I can go down there for that. Yeah, I know you can, young brother, but we a new business starting out. Talk to him, because what happens is, don't let him walk out the door. Do whatever you gotta do to try to get him. Say, look man, if you get two of them, I give them to you for a dollar. Come on, brother, work with me. But I'm gonna tell you why it's important. What happens is, you know his name. Find out what his name is. Remember who he is. He's your brother. Eventually, you're going to develop a relationship. Understand something. We're going to start talking about that part too, but he can go and get a good price in the Asian store, but he can never get nobody that cares about him. When you're a black-owned business, you're not just selling your good and product. You're selling respect for our people. You're saying courtesy. You're selling advice that nobody else is going to give them because everybody else is trying to exploit them. You got something else to offer him, a relationship. He might buy that first time and he gonna go back down there, but if you treat him with respect, if he comes in a second time, you remember his name? Hey, young blood, how you doing? He now has a relationship too. He ain't just buying your good, he buying a relationship with a man that he ain't never had a positive relationship with no man because his father wasn't there. He buying a relationship with a sister who not trying to bleed his pockets, but with a sister that's actually trying to help him. That's not what happened because his mother was on crack. See. See, you're not just dealing with somebody to come you want to get money. This is a man, young man, don't know how to pick a young woman. He don't know. He look, the, the bigger her body is, the bigger the body part, that's what he want. He don't know that's going to leave him a lot of pain because he's not looking for the right things in a woman to find a good kind of woman. So he's picking one that's going to hurt him. Guess who can teach him the ropes and tell him what he needs to do the right thing? You can. You develop that relationship. And what happens is you become the business owner, but you also like a big brother, like a father, like a big sister, somebody who cares about the person. Where they coming in and they not just, look, you've seen it here, secrets of nature. How many times you come up there and there's a person standing up there and you come around and you've been here 20 minutes, they still up at the counter talking to Brother Court. This is where we come for healing, for conversation, 
and things of that nature. If you don't have those things available for your people, you're missing out on the opportunity because these are real black people with histories, with pain. Most of the people in our community have been sexually abused, brothers and sisters, particularly the women. If you don't know that, you don't know that that sister coming through the door has low self-esteem. God forbid she's dark skinned. Then the world has told her she has no value. You got to have a picture of a beautiful dark skinned sister on your wall. Why? Why do you have that there? Because she needs that. Because she a little young 13 year old girl who thinks she's black and ugly and now would do anything with her body or do anything like that because she doesn't have a sense of value because the world has told her she don't have value. Say, who is that? Oh, this is one of the most beautiful women in such regions. She's a queen, a princess. She ain't looking at how beautiful she is. She's saying she dark skinned and you think she's beautiful? That means maybe I can be beautiful? She ain't never heard or seen nothing like that. You selling her something different, self-esteem. The boys need it too. The boys, you black and ugly, you look like a monkey. He think that he has no value. So he'll be with any woman that'll, 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 that'll show something and she can take everything from him and, and anything he got, she can have it because he's just looking for some validity. But you can give him validity and don't rob, you ain't robbing him. He don't have to do nothing but come in there, feel good about himself. You can have the videos every place we go, every black owned business. See, and this is about psychology. It doesn't sound like it's about business, but it really is. If your community is a community that's being underserviced, then every video about how black people are being underserviced, you should have it available for people to be able to buy. Since your people are people who've been sexually abused, you should have videos there that talk about how people can heal from the sexual abuse. Because eventually it's going to come out or they can see it and you'll identify that. You don't have to bring that up to the person, but they'll see, man, what is this about? Oh, that's about dealing with the pain of sexual abuse. A lot. Then you can start talking to it. A lot of people, they 40, 50 years old, still haven't dealt with the pain from that. And this helps them heal and realize it wasn't their fault. They need that. It's nowhere else in the world they can get that. They can get it from you. And you got it. If you understand what's going on in your people. Brothers don't have fathers in the home. He don't know how to be a man. We were just outside and Brother DeFree saw a brother walking down the street with his... Pants almost at his knees. I, I see it so much, I didn't say anything. Brother DeFree called him right over here. Come over here, brother. Let me talk to you. We talked to that young brother about five minutes. After he finished, that brother was shaking our hands, telling us he understood that it came from homosexual culture in prison, and he pulled his pants up, walked on down the street. Brother named Jojo, right? Got the brother name. We talked to him. Brother DeFree did that, just being a man. Now, when that brother see Brother DeFree again, you think he's going to walk by and not speak, or is he going to speak and want to come talk to him again? Because he got something for him. Every black business should be able to understand the psychology. What are the problems that your community is facing? Whatever those problems are, everybody that walks through that door is dealing with one or some of those problems. You got to have a basic understanding of your people so that you can offer this life to them so they can, one, heal, and two, they're going to keep coming and supporting because they're not just buying your good or product, they're buying healing. That's important, brothers and sisters. And now we're going to talk about something because I want you to look at these videos you're about to see as we listen to Amos Wilson explain. There's a little bit of a problem when we're talking about why the black entrepreneur has problems. It's two things you sell people, life or death. That's what you're selling them. You're selling them life or you're selling them death. Here's the problem. Out of a people, particularly, let's talk about black people. I ain't gonna talk about everybody. We're talking about black people. Our culture naturally is a life culture. Why we love having children, having celebrations, cookouts, all the children come. Life, man, we got food on the table. Life, everything up, 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 up. We want production, more, more, more to do better for ourselves. We looking, we are forward looking people. That's our natural. We wanna dance and celebrate. This is who we are. We are vibrant people. However, Amos Wilchin talks about the creation of tastes. He talks about, he calls it possession. And basically what he says is that when an enemy culture, we talk about whites in particular, implant ideas in a group of people and make them want things that are naturally not the things that they will want, they no longer have a culture, they have a reverse culture. Yes, sir. And what whites have done with our people is that they have changed our natural inclination for brothers to want a sister and to be married and have a lot of children, for us to have businesses in our community, for us to treat each other with respect. Hey, brother and sister, our language, everything about us, they have stripped that out. 
They've implanted negative stuff that makes us want death. And so now, unless you selling black people death, it's hard for you to have a business. Because it's only the few of our people that are still looking for life that you can sell to. That is a crisis for the black world community. Because the things that you should be able to sell black people and be, make millions off of, you can't sell them. Because our people are tuned into death. And so I'm going to show these images. We're not trying to be, you know, uh, 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 you know, try to shock people, but this is real. I'm going to show you images of black men, women, and children. This is really the condition of our community. And as you're watching this and listening to Amos Wilson, I want you to be thinking, what am I going to sell these people? How am I going to employ these people? What is it they want? What do they have a taste for? And I want you to be thinking as you're watching this, what kind of crisis does this put for the black entrepreneur? Single uh, parenthood, something which became a majority uh, factor only about 20 years ago. Yeah, since the 1970s. This has not been the condition of black people. This, where, where the single-headed family has become the majority family in the black community, is a recent occurrence. Yes, it is. And, and, and yes, and of course to destroy and to maintain our system here, their system. In other words, the youngsters are coming up in the, in the general system of the word in family structures that even 20, 30 years ago youngsters didn't come up in. You had to look at this. This is the situation that we face. Hopelessness, negative conservative political administrations, mass advertisement that looks at teenagers as a market. When I was a kid, you got what your parents bought. That's right. That's right. To a great extent, the advertising was to convince the parents to buy for the children. Right. Now it's reversed. You look at even little kids are representing the market. Five-year-olders represent a $10 billion market. How do we get them to spend it? How do they get a $10 billion? You know they're going to worry mom and dad to death. We get it. You know that. Teenagers, you talk what? Directly to them. The TV talks directly to the little kids. When you sit them down in front of the TV, the sugar ads for the cereal, the toys, and the whole thing talks directly to the children. It doesn't say, come in, mama, and look at this so you can buy it. Now, the child gets the message and takes it to the parent. And now so the children are looked at as a market. And what is going on with advertising? Desire is being created. You see, we often say, freedom is doing what we want to do. That's not freedom. You got to figure out what made you want to do it in the first place. And when you when you trace your wants and desires, you may find out that they have actually been artificially what created. And therefore, when you are pursuing most what you want, you are most enslaved. However, psychologically, you feel most what free. And that's the backwardness of the system. You see. And so you get these things that manipulate the taste of Af American people. What did I just say about Pepsi? That's a manipulation of taste. And the European then makes you want everything that he owns. And if you got it, it's no good. He has no good at all. Yeah. He only has value if what? He has it. Then he creates a taste for it. And then sets the limits and the, the rules for getting it. Yeah, and plays the game. If you want this, you gotta do this. You gotta do that. And the game is on. This is what our teenagers face in a way that we never face. The total flow of guns. Was that hard to watch? Yes. Very hard to watch, right? But this this is what's <laughs> this is what's so real about it. I want you to really think about it. We talking about black business. You say, well, what does this have to do with black business? Think about it. These young ladies, 13 to 14, 15 years old, humping tombstones. What can you sell them? Can you sell them a book? Do they want a book? Can you sell them a nice dress where they fully dressed? Can you sell them life at all? Do they know about life? What have they got a taste for? Only thing I can see, Corey might be able to sell them some condoms. If they're going to use those, but I mean, and I'm not trying to be vulgar, but I'm saying this is what's in them. Somebody's implanted this. This is what they're doing. What are you going to say? Those young males humping the walls. 
pants hanging down. You see brothers like this with their pants hanging. All this is what they doing in the house. They think they're females now. I want you to consider, just from a pure black business perspective, can I hire them? Can Brother Coy have them working behind the counter, brothers? Are you going to keep coming here and buying what you buying, and that dude standing googly eyed behind the counter? You're going to go right upside his head, or you're going to say, you know what, I, ain't, I can't do it. I'm, I'm, I can't go back up in there. Even sell it to him. Yeah, you can, you'll sell to him, but how many of them do you want coming how frequently in your business? Is that going to bring more people in there or less? It depends. If you're selling death, you don't care, right? But if you're selling your people life, discussions like this, how you going to bring that sister who got her children treating her like a prostitute on a pole, overweight, and got babies indoctrinated with a taste for degeneracy and exploitation of black women, what you going to sell them here? What, they, what, what life are they looking for? They don't know that life is available. All they know is death. A black male who would stand in between two sisters, throwing money at them so they could smack each other to see who quits first. That's what whites used to do to us on the plantation. That's what they did to us, where they would bet and see which one of us brothers would have to fight to the death. And whites would pay big money to bet and see who would kill who. That's where the whole boxing and wrestling, all that stuff comes out of the slave plantation, where the whites would place bets on black people to kill each other. We now in a culture where a black male, he's not a man, because a man does not want to see his women defile each other and half nakedly dressed. He'll look at somebody else's women like that, but not his own. He has respect and he reveres his own women. He protects them if he's a man. And so my point being, this is a real crisis because you can't sell these people books. You can't sell them health. You can't sell them, you can't sell them anything in here. But can you sell them liquor? Can you sell them weed? Can you sell them crack? Can you sell her booty shorts? Can you sell them hip hop degeneracy, talking about killing black people and calling them the N-word? See, the whites have very, very intricately and sophisticatedly created a system where the only thing that our people will buy is death, because that's all they know. And if they come into some place like this, it's weird to them. Because they like, uh, I just don't understand. Because it's life, and they never seen life before. Nobody ever called them brother and sister and actually wanted to say something positive. They don't even know what that is. Natural hair, what? what? They don't know what that is. <clears throat> a black man wanting to help him, but not wanting to sleep with him, just trying to do it because there's a sister he's looking out for. Walk her to her car, open the door. All right, be safe, sister. Not asking for it. He don't even know. She don't know what that is. And so it's a crisis for black businesses because when black people are trying to go into business, you really can only sell to older black people who got homes and stuff like that. You might be able to be a plumber or something like that. That's something you need. But if you're going to our young people, unless you're selling death, which, again, if you're a black business, you're selling life, progress, which you're going to sell our people. Ain't nothing to sell them, which is why you see so many businesses try to do the right thing at first. Then they start selling smut, and then they start going down the line because the only thing our people have been given a taste for is death. And which is why the black businesses help develop and maintain taste while we need them. Because people get what's available. So if you got black businesses in their community and that's all they have is life, that's all they're going to go for is life. And they're going to get accustomed to it because that's what their people in their community give them. But the Asians can't give you life because if they gave you life, you would stop spending your money with them. The whites can't give you life. They can only sell you death. That's why they got the crack bags for the crack dealers that sell the crack. Because they want to keep you down, because if you're down, you'll keep spending your money with them. That's why everything that you need to facilitate your death, liquor, drugs, drug paraphernalia, everything you need to kill yourself, the Asians in your community provide you, and the whites. But anything you need to come out of that, self-esteem, knowledge of self, is dry like the, the valley of dry bones among these outsiders in our community, because the only way they can bleed you economically is to have you ignorant and hating yourself, and so they sell you death, and that's all we know, and that's all we buy. We're going to go a little deeper now. Y'all all right? Yes, I ain't scared your way, ever. No, all right, y'all getting kind of quiet. Bring it on. All right, let's bring some more. We're going to go a little deeper. The truth of it is, we're a race of cowards. Say it again. I'm going to say it again. Yes, Thank you, brother. I wanted to say it again anyway, and my brother gave me permission. 
That's my south side homie back then. Black people are cowards. And what has happened is, particularly I got to speak to the elders. This is what the elders have done that's really been a real treasonous thing they've done to the young people. And of course it's not all of them, but I ain't talking all, we being in general. The elders know how badly white folks have treated us because they grew up in environments where they had to go to the back door. My grandmama used to tell me, she told me how she had to get her bread through a hole in the back door in the South in Emporia, Virginia. She had to go to a back door through a hole to get some bread and don't get the same quality bread that the white folks get. My point being, we know, particularly the older people, that we've had black infrastructure and we've heard the stories of how whites have destroyed those infrastructures. But we don't tell the truth to our children that white folks are out to get them. So our children don't go up prepared to fight. That's right. And if you don't grow up prepared to fight in a society, you're going to be swaddled up like, like, like a guppy in the ocean by a whale. And that's been a huge problem. I did some research and I intended to go through a litany. I wasn't able to do it. I need somebody and I want people to hear this. This is very important. There's a Holocaust we don't even talk about. The Holocaust of the destruction of black infrastructure in the history of this country, black communities, black businesses, how many patents that black men and women have created of, of products that white folks just stole them and have made trillions of dollars on that was supposed to be money that's supposed to be coming in our community. How many farms have been stolen and, and buildings burned down in whole communities? If someone does this book, because when I start doing it, I realize it's way too extensive for me to put in, in the lecture. I did, I couldn't believe it. I would say this would be my estimate. It might be more or less, but I think it's probably more. At least a thousand communities in this country have been destroyed by whites. New Orleans would have just been one. The black communities down there, we, that would just be one I'm talking about. What we saw, it's still happening, we just don't recognize what's happening. I'm talking about communities where black people owned everything. Malls, shopping centers, and jets. These white folks came in, burned them down, and just took it. And gave that wealth to their children. There's a holocaust, an economic holocaust of the black race in America that's worthy of a 300 plus page book that will have any black person reading it crying to understand it is not true that we didn't have black business infrastructure. In fact, black people in this country have built more economic infrastructure than anybody in this country, including the whites, including the small hats, including Asians. We've done more than anybody. We just had it all taken away from us, which is I'm bringing this point up because it's very relevant. The reality of it is something we don't learn in our schools. I went to Hampton University, was a finance major, but they never told me this. Business is warfare, brothers and sisters, and it always has. And we're going to look at some videos, but I want you to understand something. The only way to keep a community down, you cannot keep any community in the world oppressed if they have wealth and if they can attain wealth. I'm going to say it again. If they can attain, if they got wealth and they know how to produce wealth, you cannot keep them down. You can kill them, you can shoot them, you can take the stuff, they'll always bounce back. As long as they can develop wealth, they can finance, change, they can always bounce back. And what the whites have done in this country, and because we're cowards, we don't we lie to our children because we realize it's the unspoken reality. Why don't black people start businesses? Because deep down in our psychology, we know that if we started, these crackers gonna come. So you can start a little independent business, that's fine, mom and pop shop. But the minute you threaten white economic infrastructure or threaten to build something that can start lifting black people economically out of their situation, they bring in the dogs. They bring in everything. Good example, one person in recent history that was able to do it, Murray Burry. He got into a position of power, he turned the whole economic infrastructure over to us here. Now we got the wealthiest black suburb in this country, uh, 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 Prince George's County. One person that I can say in modern history that didn't care about it, stay loyal to our people, and the reason they couldn't kill him is because every thug in this city, every black person in this city had a job because of Marion Burry, and they thought about harming a hair on his head, the kind of cats that don't listen to nobody. See, these the, the Rayful Edmonds and these kind of murders, yeah, but even when Marion Burry didn't like you, we all universally like Marion Burry. And ain't nobody had to tell us what to do if something happened to Burry. They couldn't even harm the man, even though he took the economic infrastructure of this city and gave it to our people. But in reality, 
99% of these wars we have lost. And it has created a lack of desire of our people to go out here and fight economically because the reality of it is once you start building wealth for black people, you have declared war with white folks and they are coming. And so we're going to start, we're going to watch this little video. It's from Banished. It's very short, but it, this demonstrates, just give you an idea of what we're talking about. In 1864, in Washington County, Indiana, white residents made a very simple proposal to the black community, leave or die. In 1886, a mob of 500 whites in Comanche County, Texas, lynched a black teenager and then forced every black out of the county. In 1901, in Pierce City, Missouri, after the death of a white woman, a black man was hung and two others burned in their homes. Then, at gunpoint, the remaining blacks were told to leave town. In 1905 and 1909, Harrison, Arkansas's white citizens expelled their African-American neighbors in two waves of terror. And in Forsyth County, Georgia, in 1912, black homes were dynamited forcing more than 1,000 black residents of the county to flee. The pattern is eerily similar. An alleged crime against a white woman, the lynching of a black man, and the expulsion of the black community. The land the blacks left behind was lost forever, leaving a haunting legacy where many of these counties remain virtually all white to this day. see that because it a little I mean that's a small brief insight again I want somebody to hear this and do a book on this I want you to go through each city and town that was destroyed whether it was 12 homes or 20. I want you to do something comprehensive so a lot of people can read through it and go wow we have a holocaust in and of itself of what they've done to us economically so that our people can see that and say okay when we start building stuff for our economic development we got to also know what's coming and know how to be prepared for it because it's been universal uh, uh, in our development. This system, I'm gonna show you a little bit on Sister Ida B. Wells, and I'm not gonna do much talking, I'm gonna show you the video, but it's important because many of us know her to be a freedom fighter who fought against lynchings. Again, we don't understand what lynchings were really about. The more I study this, the more I realize, wow, we got a false impression. One, the reason that they were able to lynch so many black people in the South without re repercussions, because they used to lie. Black people didn't know that these were uh, 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 good, decent people. They thought, we thought they was killing them for what they said. They raped somebody. Just like today, if some dude out here rapist and the police pull them over and get them, you're like, good, get them out of our community. They had no idea that these were good, decent people. They didn't know. So we let it happen until we found out, which this sister, Ida B. Wells Barnett, when she found out what was really going on, two brothers opened up a grocery store and the whites didn't like them having a grocery store and told them they better shut the grocery store down. When they didn't do it, they lynched them and murdered them and said they had raped the white female. And that's when she said, wait a minute, it's not true. She wrote an article in the paper and the brothers in Tennessee and Memphis start taking up arms. Sister went out of town to tell the story and the wives of the men in the city in, in Memphis called her up and said, do not come back to this city because the whites said they're going to meet you at the train station and murder you. And all of us going to be widows because all of our husbands that said if they murder her, they're going to murder her after we murder them. Because all the men in, the, in the Memphis, Tennessee had gotten together and armed themselves and said they are not going to hurt our sister when she get off that train. So the wives collected money and sent it to her and tell her to stay out of Memphis so that we can keep our husbands. To understand, we do fight. But why were the lynchings happening? A substantial portion of the lynchings were happening. You know why? Economics. Black people were starting to develop businesses and pull themselves out and give other black people jobs. And now once you got money, you can educate people. You can do all this stuff. So what happens? So what happens is the whites say we can't let them get out because if they develop wealth, 
and economic power, you can't keep them enslaved. And so what do they do? Start murdering everybody that knows how to build business infrastructure. Let's look at this freedom fighter, Sister Ida B. Wells Barnett, and what led to her fighting the anti-lynching campaign. Ida B. Wells' activism really stems for her, from her career as a journalist. Um, and she began to ex raise the question about why lynching occurred in the South, and particularly to challenge the stereotype of lynching being a result of African-American women, African-American men raping white women. Under God, I have done work without any assistance from my own people. And when I think that I have been able to do the work with his assistance that you could not do if you would, and you would not do if you could, I think I have a right to a feeling of strong indignation. With that, I walked out of the meeting and left them sitting with their mouths open. Blacks never did really have an opportunity economically to get back into mainstream America. The end of the Civil War on April 9th, 1865, also ended 246 years of slavery for over 4 million African Americans under oppression by white power. Legally stopped from education and economic opportunities under captivity, the race moved swiftly to take advantage of new rights extended under the Constitution. President Abraham Lincoln and Congress passed landmark legislation. One of the things that we'll find is that Lincoln, in uh, his Emancipation Proclamation, was definitely uh, paying attention to not offending the South, but at the same time uh, ridding the nation of the stain of black slavery. But Southern states, however, resented this new black equality and worked to undermine national laws during this period known as Reconstruction from 1865 to 1875. Hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan emerged and used violent methods such as lynching to discourage African Americans from exercising their new rights. The race was voting in large numbers to elect legislators that delivered benefits in their neighborhoods. But white Southern racists were fearful that African Americans would gain too much political and economic power. So they took steps, often violent, to take the vote and suppress freedom. African Americans who dared to vote were injured or murdered. But this didn't frighten them off. They kept voting to elect men like Pickney Benton Stewart Pinchbach, who served as state senator and lieutenant governor of Louisiana during Reconstruction. The national government ignored these blatant violations against African Americans. Rights that the race had earned were taken away by 1900 in the South. Frequent violence against them grew. It became commonplace. Racist white mobs went on killing sprees, murdering unarmed African-American men, women, and children. Lynching happened so often that it became an accepted reality in African-American life. The perpetrators were not stopped by legal authorities at the state or federal levels. Ida B. Wells, born into slavery, rose to challenge this brutality and her work brought worldwide attention to the lynching issue. Born July 16, 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi, she was the oldest of eight children. Her parents, both former slaves, strongly stressed education and self-esteem to their children. Because of this kind of nurturing, Wells had a great thirst for knowledge. She graduated from Rust College in Holly Springs and stretched herself by taking extra classes whenever she could to sharpen her skills. After passing the teaching test by the fall of 1884, Wells was teaching in Memphis City Schools. She also wrote for a church paper and her talents attracted the attention of the free speech newspaper. They made her an offer to be an editor and she accepted. Her brief teaching career ended in 1891 when Wells was fired in the all-black Memphis school system for writing an article in the free speech that criticized the poor conditions for students. After being dismissed, she started writing full-time, and she saved what she could to buy an interest in the newspaper. Traveling on one of her regular trips for subscribers in Natchez, Mississippi in 1892, she heard about another horrible lynching in Memphis. This time, three African-American males who owned the business had been murdered by a white mob. 
they were close friends of Wells. During this era, African Americans who dared to go into business risked being killed. And blood at the roots. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. I bring this up, brothers and sisters. I thought it was really, really uh, important because we got to understand there's a reason why our people don't have that black infrastructure. It's not just that we don't do anything. We're not lazy people. He said, you cannot talk about business in the larger scale. The mom and pop shop, again, you don't have to feel threatened if you want to start a little store or do some business, brother and sister. Don't be afraid. It's not until you actually start developing serious, significant wealth and have an impact in competing with white interests that you run into this. But the reality of it is that's what's going to end up happening. And they use all different kinds of tricks. Even had a place in Washington, D.C. Brother started something called Mega Foods years ago over in Northeast. What happened? When the whites start finding out he had a grocery store, do you know that the suppliers stopped supplying them? The white suppliers found out there's a black grocery store, they stopped supplying them. Then had a, had a, had a, had a white male come because the brother had said, hey, I'm going to have it in the, in the neighborhood. Got black mothers who had never worked before. These are sisters been on welfare their whole life, giving them a job, making their own way. They all proud. What happens? Not understanding that business is warfare. White boy come in. Hey, y'all need to have a union. Not showing loyalty to the brother that hired him, but now listening to the white. Y'all should get paid more money. They start listening to the white boy. Now they start a union. The brother can't afford those fees. The city not giving them the money they say they're going to give them to help them. The white suppliers. No longer giving him the, uh, uh, won't supply him because they found out he black. Black grocery store fail. We say, oh, we don't know how to do business. No, we know how to do business. We don't know how to war. We don't know how to fight. We don't know how to have somebody we can call and say, look, man, that supply down in Georgia. Yeah, man, the Burma, he, he won't even sell us nothing. For real? Well, where he located? Okay, yeah, I think he might sell you something next time you call him. Call him next week. Give him a call again next week and see what he say. Or maybe... If he won't sell to you, maybe he can't sell to nobody. Maybe he don't have nothing to sell no more. You know what I mean? It's like, this is a battle. I mean, you can't get into serious business and thinking that you black and people just going to let us go out here and get wealthy. If you do that, you're a liar. You're lying to black people because you're putting the person at odds. You got to tell them, look, you better have your army of attorneys. You better have you some brothers that you can call on and say, look, uh, Got a little job for you, man. Uh, we got some problems, you know what I'm saying? The tax man leaning on me. I haven't done nothing different than everybody else doing. I need him to stop leaning on me. Call your attorneys or call other folks. Call somebody. We got to be organized and know you're not in it by yourself. When you're developing wealth for black people or even if for yourself as a black person, they're going to start watching you and you're going to start having problems. Like this man here, Brother Lewis Allen. You ever heard of the cold cases? They have these cases in the South where they murdered brothers and sisters and... And uh, they have more 60 minutes and stuff like that. And they never arrested anybody. And they know who did it, but it's never been resolved. Well, Brother Lewis Allen, one thing people don't know about this brother, he was an independent entrepreneur. Brother was making the kind of money. He was making a salary, his own salary, self-made salary back then you could live off of today, back in the 40s and 50s. So he was clocking in dough. He was making money, able to give black people jobs. And he was taking his money, organizing with brothers and sisters to give education to the people in Louisiana, Mississippi area, because he was from Mississippi and lived in Louisiana. Whitey got mad at him, didn't like he was stirring up things. He was a proud black man, had land for his own family. They murdered him. Freedom fighter murdered in the South because he was giving economic development and waking people up and showing black people that we don't have to live under the foot of European domination we can do for ourselves. Killed my brother. But that's all right because his grandson... Is a brother we love very much. Let's get his brother, Louis Ali, a round of applause. Because he could have quit and he could have stopped. But would you believe that right now, just like you remember in the 1960s, they had the Freedom Riders and the people uh, uh, in Loudons County uh, where they were starting the Black Panther Party and all that kind of stuff going on where black people were saying, we're going to vote and put our own people in and get some of this stuff going on for our people, that the grandson of this freedom fighter here, 
Brother Louis Ali has started the black, the hot black coffee party. He said, if they can have a tea party, we can have a hot black coffee party where we can bring black people together. And what are they doing? They going around, they identifying the kind of contracts. If 50% of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, black population, they get less than 1% of the dollars to do work in that community, which keeps black people what? Poor and broke. He said, nah, nah, nah. We 50%? We're going to get 50% of the dollars to do 50% of the work, and we're going to do an outstanding job, and we're going to employ our people. So what happened with him right now? He down there meeting every week, going from city to city in the South, just like in the 1960s. But you're not seeing this on your TV. They talk about what black men are doing and not doing. This brother, city to city, organizing black people, talking about uh, uh, some of these high uh, prices for water that they're charging people, organizing them politically to do stuff about it. All of a sudden, the black place that he meeting at every week, give him a call. Oh, the mayor came by. The mayor and the sheriff, and they all came by and told me, I can't let you meet here no more. He said, well, brother, isn't this your facility? Yeah, but they told me as long as you friends with that irritated genie and them war on the horizon, folks, you can't, you can't, you, we can't have no relationship with you. So now they looking for their own place to meet now. But that hasn't stopped them. But what am I saying? Again, you got people who know how to build black communities, who know how to get black people out of their condition. And what do the white folks do? First, they attack through the Negroes, get them to take everything away from them. You know black folks, we don't care. One thing go away, we build something else. And after they get to the point where the Negroes won't do their job for you, then they start sticking the police and various other things on you. So we're going to be in very much support of our brother down here because he's not afraid. And see, he down there in Louisiana, them brothers and sisters down there, well, white folks are real still white folks. They with our ancestors, our, our, our older people used to call them crackers. And Peckerwood, they real crackers down there. They don't, they don't pretend like they don't hate you. They call you an N-word in Louisiana. I mean, they, they ain't no things. Matter of fact, in certain areas, people black today tell you, don't go past that road sign right there. We do not go in that part of town in areas of the south. So that's what they fighting down there. Let's give them another round of applause for being brave and fighting. We rounding down now, but I want to make a point. We don't understand. How are they disenfranchising black people? How is the economic underdevelopment of black people occurring in the modern times? Let's talk about the black farmers. Did you know that in 1910, nearly one million, we had a million black farmers? One million black farmers. How many we got now? Less than 18,000. In 1920, one in every seven farmers was black. Now, one in almost every 70 farmers is black. In 1980s, African Americans have been losing land at a rate of 9,000 acres per week. Now, here's the thing. We always sometimes think it's our own errors and mistakes that lead to why we're not doing well, so we don't start doing anything about it. It took black people almost 100 years to realize the reason we was losing all this land. Yeah, we had some situations we didn't write a will and heirs, and some of our children didn't want to do farming. That's not why we lost the land. You want to know why we lost the land? And why we're losing the land? Dig this. Eventually, in the 1970s, the black farmers start getting together and say, wait a minute, man, something's going wrong. The government is stealing our land on purpose. So they start investigating, and they put pressure on the U.S. government, and there was a committee called the Civil Rights Commission. In 1982, the Civil Rights Commission stated, when they did their research and investigated, that the catalyst of the decline of the black farmer was the USDA. That year alone, in 1982, black people received only 1% of all farm ownership loans. What people don't understand, this is how farms in the U.S. work. They get a loan from the USDA, they plant their stuff, when it comes, they sell it on the market, they keep the profit, and they pay their loans back. They do it every year. That's black, white, whoever you are, if you're a farmer, that's how it's done. But guess what? They won't give any loans to the black people. And the black people thought it was something they was doing until they did the research. Well, look what they found when they did the research. Now, look, they found out that the USDA was preventing black people from having land for the purpose of making sure we couldn't feed ourselves and we had no land, right? So what was the first thing the Reagan administration did? They shut down the Civil Rights Office. So the very office that investigated and found out this was going on, now they shut them down, so now you can't do anything. And how do you know for certain? Because some, you know, some of our people are skeptical. No, that's not why we lost the land. Dig this. Now, keep in mind, they're going to deny you the loan anyway. But if they deny you the loan in the right amount of time, you can go somewhere else and get a loan. Right. But what happened? 
when they did an investigation, if you were white, they processed your loan in 60 days. But for black farmers, it took 220 days. So you done missed your crop. They going to deny you anyway, so you didn't go and get any other further money to support your thing. And even if they didn't deny you, your crop is already gone now. So you won't be able to pay this back because you got a bad crop, but it's going to grow on top of a bad crop. And they gave you money that you can't pay back now because you got to wait another whole year for your crop to come back. And you can't pay your loan back. So then they come and steal your land and give it to somebody white, sell it off at the auction. This is what they have been doing to black people economically. You kind of keep it real, brothers and sisters. I know you said you thought it was going to be, we're going to talk a little bit, but anybody know who that is? Yeah. Who is that? Ron Brown. Who was Ron Brown? Secretary of Commerce. Now let's talk about this for a minute because I remember, you know, he, he died in 1996 of a strange plane crash. Say it again, sister. She said he was killed. Listen to Dick Gregory. They said the autopsy showed he had a bullet to the back of his head. Now, why is that relevant to our discussion? Again, for the average brother, sister that want to start your business, this is not to scare you. You can start your business. But he wasn't trying to start no business. Ron Brown had gone to Africa and said, you know what? We want to lower all the barriers to the black economies in Africa so that they can do free trade and start building wealth. Because they have a lot of the minerals that the world needs. They should be some of the richest countries in the world. And Clinton and the boys said, nah, nah, go ahead, start, slow that thing down with Africa. We know now, why? We didn't know then. We didn't know that they were going to colonize Africa like they did America, and they was on their way over there, so they had to come take it. We ain't know that then, but we know it now. But because Ron Brown was just a black man saying, forget that, if we can do it for all these other countries, we can do it for Africa. They said, oh, yo, yo, so you're not going to listen to us. He said, well, I'm a secretary of commerce. I'm going to do what I got to do to help these African nations. I'm black. These are black people. I'm going to help them. End up with a bullet in the back of his head, mysterious plane crash. One of the females actually lived. They got tape of the female who lived through the crash. All of a sudden, she ended up dead too. Why? Because if you black and you start trying to build economic business infrastructure or challenge the way they're doing business to help black people out of it, then you start ending up in a war. Who else? Let's talk about this. Who is that? Y'all know who he is. Bill Cosby. Now, why am I putting Bill Cosby up here? He's just an entertainer, right? But I got to say, he a pseudo activist because I'm going to tell you, he got a, a video. If you get a chance to get it, watch it. It's called Black History Lost, Stolen, or Strayed. He did it back in the 60s or 70s. Excellent. You know, it's powerful. Bill Cosby, not your average Negro. He's a really good Negro. He's a Negro. <laughs> He's a Negro, though. <laughs> But he's a good Negro. He's the Negro. If you got to have a Negro around Bill Cosby, because he does care about how black people look and how we feel about ourselves and how we carry ourselves and how the media depicts us. Why is he up here? Let's talk about it. How many people know that in 1992 and 1993, Bill Cosby tried to buy NBC? He did it twice. In 1992, he tried to slide in there and buy the whole network. They found out and the small heads got, I mean, they went ballistic. Then he had the nerve to come back in 1993 and try to buy it again. And they just started basically telling him, look, you know what, you, you, I don't care how many billions you got, you know what you are, you ain't getting no network. So do y'all know why he wanted to buy the network, though? See, that's the story that's not told. I started doing research, I couldn't believe this. Bill Cosby had decided that TV was too degenerate and that there was nothing promoting family, and in particular, black people were depicted as a bunch of dogs and demons. And he was like, we can make just as much money and we can take over the airways with positive messages that we can do with negative messages. I know, Bill Cosby said, I know I can do it because when we put the Cosby show, we took over TV. So Bill Cosby was like, y'all don't understand, I want you to understand. It wasn't like he just said, I want to buy a network. He was fighting them on the degeneracy. Remember real recently, three or four years ago, he came out saying, Stop walking around and you know, acting. That's part of his, this is decency thing is a Cosby thing. Well, see, remember, who controls the taste of our people? The whites, the media. That's how they make us want all this death. If you get Cosby on there making us change it, they can't do the things they're doing to our people. He ain't look at it like that. He ain't understand what he was fighting. He was just like, I want a network to show you I can do better programming than you do. He's, he's launching a war he ain't even know. So what happened? From 1994 to 1996, he said, okay, you're not going to let me do a network. Fine, I'm going to do some programming. So now he's trying to put all kind of TV shows. I mean, literally, he's fighting the degeneracy. He's like, this filthy stuff is on TV. It shouldn't be on here. 
And he got power. I want you to understand he got influence and power because of who he is. The, the small heads finally got sick of it. What did Bill Cosby have that he loved? He had a son. 1997, Bill Cosby's son, mysteriously, his tire blows out. He's on the side of a road trying to take care of his tire. And a small hat, white so-called Jew, who runs the media? Small hats, the white so-called Jews. Now, this is a criminal from Russia. How he even got in the country, don't nobody have an answer for that. He was a criminal in Russia. I'm saying if you research him, you can go up and do the research. He's a criminal in Russia. Mikhail Markasev. How he even got in the U.S., don't nobody know. He finally confessed to the murder and said, I was pulled over to rob him. Yet, he didn't rob him. He pulled over. Walked up to Bill Cosby's son, shot him and murdered him, and got back in his car and drove off. Now, he's in, he went to jail for it, but my point is what? After 1997, you ain't heard Bill Cosby trying to buy no networks. Warfare. This is warfare. I know people think all oh, these conspiracy theories. Well, these are conspiracy theories because we can't prove them. But guess what? We got over hundreds of years, 200 years of things that occur in this same exact pattern to say this is what makes sense. I'm not mad at Mill Cosby because I know he's trying to do the right thing, but I will say something about some of our brothers and sisters getting these high positions. You make a bad decision. You get so high and mighty on your horse that you don't want to have no connection and reach back to people like us because we too militant. We fight too hard. We, we screaming down the throat of the, of the European. We, we say things you can't say, but you make a desperate mistake. Murray Burry didn't make that mistake. Mary Burry stayed tied in right to everyday people. What's the difference between you and everyday people? You can talk, you can spend money, you can help us build what we have here into an empire because you have mastered the economics of it. But when somebody murder your son, you go cry. Your brother says, out here ain't gonna go cry. See, if Bill Cosby was putting in and had the outreach, so he don't have to come show his face all the time. If he was helping us, we would know that. He was helping us with community centers in our community. Right to the hood, to the people who are his people. Helping them up grow, just like Mary Burry. You can't go kill that man's son like that. He, Bill Cosby don't have to make a call. If, if we feel like you one of us, and you down here with us, we're not going to let nobody just go. See, you can buy stuff. You, you, you mastered that part. But what have you mastered to do when somebody come chin you, check your chin? You ain't got nothing for that. But the people in the community, they might not got no money, but they got something for that. So we really need each other because they can track you. You can't do none if you wanted to. But your son didn't have to die by himself. If somebody, if you're trying to do something good for your community and somebody going to go kill your son and send a message, don't you think that the community you're trying to save should be able to send messages? But the community don't send no message for you because you're never there for us. So y'all Negroes need to listen to what I'm saying. If you're a pure Uncle Tom, it don't really apply to you because you don't care about your community at all. But if you're going to make a decision to help your community at some point, you better have some ties in that community, like Marin Burry, so that when they try to bring you down, they're going to try to catch you on a drug charge or something, but they're not going to come at you direct because they know that the penalty is too steep. And that's part of the problem of the black people who have wealth in the black community. Now, we're going to go to our last part of this discussion, and uh, I want to show you a real live case of warfare. And I want you to watch this because it's going to be a real good example of what's happening in the black community. And then we finish. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Y'all can hang on 10 more minutes? Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to show you a real living, everyday example of pure, unadulterated warfare in the black community and how it's going down. And what I want you to think when you're watching is a few things. One, consider as you're watching our tastes. When we have tastes that allow our enemies to exploit it, it makes it easier for them to take stuff from us. You'll understand when you're watching what I'm saying. When, we, when our tastes are for our upliftment, it's hard for people to exploit us because they have to prov pr provide things that help us to build ourselves stronger, which ultimately pushes them further away. So they always want us to have tastes that make us easily exploitable. So watch that as you watch this, but also watch as once we start developing power and economic strength, Watch what other communities do. They don't talk about we are the world and loving everybody. It sing silly, we shall overcome songs. They look at their economic interests and anybody they can step on, they step on. And most times those people, anybody they can step on, look like us. Right. So let's watch this 
and understand economics, business is warfare. And for black people, if we want to do anything about our condition, we got to understand that and get serious. Apply the thermal straightening box. Section the hair into We think the uh, African American style is very big business. Almost every week they change the style for hair. Everybody wants to be a part of our market because we're the number one consumer. We spend 10 to 1 on anybody in here. In the retail market right now, majority of the retail stores are ran by Koreans. And more of the Korean stores that are ran by, the 90%, are supported 100% by black African money. It's so unfair, you know, that they take our money. But once again, part of it is our blame. We allow what happens. Is this true that the Koreans dominate the black hair industry? What you're looking at is one of the black beauty supply magazines that inform people who are interested in black hair products. All the ads and articles are about African Americans and their hair. And even though all the information is about blacks, half of this magazine is in Korean. And this magazine, Beauty Times, which is the number one publication for black beauty store owners, is written entirely in Korean. Store here, what what's the percentage of your, of your business is Afro-American? Uh, oh, about 100%. 99.9. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In other words, 99.9%. One of the things that the Koreans are doing now, and they predicted this themselves uh, back in 1999, and it's happening now, since they control 80% of the distribution of Afro hair care products, especially professional products that are sold in beauty supply stores only, it only stands to reason they can control what gets distributed. They are creating their own line of products or buying out existing black-owned companies. I don't see a reversal of this at all. Uh, it's just getting deeper and deeper. With the Koreans controlling the retail and wholesale distribution, they're slowly making inroads into taking over the black manufacturers. We're going to Kazuri Products. They are a black-owned manufacturer of, uh, of hair care products, but specialize primarily in curling irons, pressing combs, and the stove heaters that you heat the irons up in. This is Lucky White, who owns Kazuri along with her husband. We have been in business for over 30 years, and we are a black company selling to black beauty supplies and also to black hairstylists, and we make a quality product. Everyone look at our product as being the best in the industry. However, since the ages have been here, they are cutting us out, telling us that our product is not in demand any longer. The Korean connection. About three years ago, they started to blacklist our product as they brought their own products in. They start to manufacture curling irons and they duplicate everything that you manufacture. They were duplicated and then they start to slowly cut back on orders and then they tell you that your product is not in demand. So they would make something that very similar that looked like ours and then they try and sell the consumer on this product. Can you show me some products from Kazuri? Kazuri? Kazuri products. This is Kazuri product. This. This is all Kazuri. Top. This is a one. So you have maybe three Kazuris, and then the we rest. This Kazuri, this A one product, this Stella. Stella. Yeah. Who makes? Three brands. Who makes Stella? Uh, you know they are B-sale, the wholesalers. And they make this this product. Actually, they make a copy, you know, for the other brand, you know, like oh. Kizuri like uh, a, a plus but their their uh, brands you know they are no good quality not good they, quality no just copy for the others they are really trying to shut us out of the industry we have to look at saving 
our community as well as saving this industry. We are a nation within this nation and we're just giving everything away and we cannot do that any longer. So it's fair to say that there are all sorts of formal and informal means by which Korean Americans and South Korean business people dominate the market and are uh, implicitly unwilling to let competition challenge their dominance. So the two magazines, they're all in Korean. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. does, that, does that seem like fair business practice? Yeah, well, as I said before, um, this is one of the mechanisms by which uh, Koreans, South Koreans and Korean American merchants um, ensure the domination of the market. And six months after the Korean ban on the export of hair, the United States government banned the import of any wig that contained hair from China. This ban on Chinese wigs virtually locked in the wig business for these South Korean merchants. So it seems that what we're seeing today, the Korean domination of the black hair industry, had its start with the help of both the Korean and the United States government almost 40 years ago. What town am I in? You're in oh, Chicago. Chicago. Chicago? Yeah, Chicago. And let's see your hairdo. Let's see it. Whoa, turn around. Who did that? My mom. Wow. Now, um, I see a, a beauty supply store right across the street. Yeah. Is that black owned or Korean owned? That's, I think that's uh, Korean, Korean owned. owned. Korean. Sorry? Korean, Korean owned. owned. What do you think about the Koreans owning all the black beauty supply stores? Well, it's very not good because I think the black people should be able to own some things. Yeah. And just not all Koreans should be able to own. But I think because why they're not doing it is because discouragement and black, most black folks, they're really uh, just like going to jail now because other people are convincing them to do other different things like crimes and different stuff like that. So that's why. And three years ago, it was purchased by Rhonda Jones and her husband, who mortgaged their home and bought the Slack Beauty Supply Store from its original owners. Less than six months ago, a Korean-owned beauty supply store opened up six doors away in the same mall. And they opened up how close to you? About six doors away. Six, I've been between six and ten doors away. And when did they open up? They opened up uh, the beginning of this year. The only, the only, the only reason I think that they open up next door is because Rhonda, this store has doubled their business in the last year. She started running radio advertising. And uh, she got, they got word that she was doing a fantastic business out here. Uh, before, they didn't even worry about it. So I think that's the reason that they decided to come out here. I feel like they came here to this area to benefit from the reputation and clientele of this store. That's what I think. Yeah. In an effort to educate consumers, Rhonda has been giving out copies of my documentary, Black Hair, more than 2,000 copies of the DVD. I go over to Ebony's Beauty Supply, and it turns out that the owner has seen the movie also. Why did you decide to open up six doors away from L&L? &L? I mean, why did you choose this location? I mean, why did you choose no, no, to no, do you, that? I want to know that. You, you are a uh, Black Beauty Association work you make today? I'm a documentary filmmaker. Documentary? And, and I'm whatever. filming you everything. Make, you make a PMB Association some CD like that. Have you seen the documentary yeah. Black Hair? 30 minutes, yeah. Yes, that's my film. You read this. What huh? is this? You think this is a pen? What is, what is this? Let me take a look here. They're going to do just a week ago, you know, try to three uh, young lady hiding to outside, you know, this provided this to my customers. Into the customers, they're going to uh, give it to this one. Someone has tried to set fire to Ebony Beauty Supply three times in the last six months. Now, I was just at the police department interviewing them, and they actually mentioned that your husband is a suspect. What, what do you think about that? I think it's, I think it's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous. 
That's what I think. Is there anything you have to say about... No, yeah, I'm not going to say anything. If my husband is a suspect in a crime who is a person who's never been arrested, never even been in a police car, of course I don't have anything to say about anything like that. I mean, that's very serious. That's very serious. And I would, you know, of course I don't have anything to say about that. We have to stand up and fight. We are, we are beautiful black people. If we have to wear our hair short, so be it. Let's wear it short, but let's uh, get this under control where we control the industry and not let someone else come in and then set up and take all our revenue out of the community. It's war time. Check, check one, two. The irritated genie. <laughs> Ready. <laughs> South Paul's in the house. The feminization of a black male. Yeah. It's a war on the horizon. Let's go, Paul. I think the point has been made. We don't want to belabor the moment now. We're very close to our conclusion. But uh, I'm thank first of all, I thank all the brothers and sisters. Give yourselves another round of applause for coming out and staying tuned in. Was this a valuable discussion? Yes, sir. Was this something that our people need? Yes, sir. All right, well, we're going to make sure we had this available in two weeks. We're going to have it, yes, sir. We're going to have it available in two weeks on our website, OneHorizon.com. Go to the store. I want to thank everybody for tuning in and coming out. And the point of this is for us to understand we can do some very simple things to do better as independent black entrepreneurs and business people to regain a, 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 a reputation for doing great work. But on the larger scale, this is warfare. And uh, if we don't understand that and we're not willing to fight, then we might as well just, well, you know what? I tell you what, instead of me saying it, we started with our brother Amos Wilson. Y'all don't mind if we let Brother Amos Wilson take us out, do you? Yes, sir. Let's hear what Brother Amos Wilson tell us what we have to do. We must not be able to love each other fully and deeply because that becomes the basis of unified action. That becomes the basis of our defending each other against our enemies. But since, if we, since in defending our, each other against our enemies, we are afraid of being annihilated by our enemies, we must repress our love. You see? Because love then for us becomes dangerous. It becomes almost associated with self-annihilation. Yeah, that's why we have trouble with it. Yeah. Because if we truly loved in the way we should, we could not see our children being miseducated and mistreated and see the kind of stuff that is happening to our people. And it means that ultimately we would have to get into the position to come one-on-one -on -one with the white man and in his capacity to do it to business with us. But we don't want war. And I'm telling you black people, you're going to have to have war or death. Yes. War on the horizon, we didn't come here to be your friends, we came here to save you. On horizon, you we we'll see you on the battlefield. Thank you, brothers and sisters. We get the lights. We got any questions? Anybody want to ask any questions before we get on out of here? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. The video we'll have that in two weeks. So when we come back two Sundays from now, we'll. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, we'll bring it here two weeks from uh, next Sunday. We won't have it, but the Sunday after that, we'll have it available here. You can get it online or you can get it right back in the back. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Yes, sir. Appreciate that, brother. Thank you for coming out. Is this, this your first time hearing about uh, War on Horizon? Yes, sir. All right, well, we, we thank you all for coming out. We appreciate that. All right, well, once again, we say we appreciate you for coming out. We say it all the time. This is the truth. We didn't come here to be anybody's friend. We came here to save our people, you know what I'm saying? So that's what we're going to do, and we're going to fight this battle until we don't have a battle to fight no more. So we always end it with say we'll see you on the battlefield. So thank you for coming out, brothers and sisters. When those crackers lynch a Negro below the Mason-Dixon line, since it is not safe to lynch a white man in any part of America, 
we shall press the button and lynch him in Africa. I'm United Front General Garley, the Black Mineral. Speaking straightforward, never dropping subliminal. African freedom fighter, yeah. white supremacy's criminal. Riddle you with lyrics, but physically I'll get rid of you. The pain and oppression, black masses they feel it too. They all can express it. I'm the vessel to spit it through. You claim that you spitting? Listen, homie, I spit a pool of blood for my ancestors. This Message they send to you, the power of the pharaoh Tell them one verse can kill a crew of Uncle Tom rappers All sellouts is getting chewed, they hijack the culture The attacker, the killer Jews, I call it how I see it Y'all ain't worried about getting sued, cause I ain't got nothing All I could do is drop a jewel, I'm always spitting heat Sonic version of summer school, I stay with some bread Tell them stack of books, but tuck the tool In case I gotta feed them, book a fool or buck a fool I really rather teach them, yep. last resort is to cut a fool but whether if I piece them or two piece them, I still love the fool Living amongst creatures, drop a bomb on the hospital When we want reparations, what will Mr. Obama do? Don't forget about Louima, yeah. ripped apart of subdominal November 25th, 50 shots took out the groom They killed him for his wallet, yep. 41 for Amadou For every shot fired, we gotta kill a whole lot of you I'm giving you the truth, got no reason to lie to you I'm trying to see us free, this man is willing to die for you The red, black, and green See it? Put the flag in the sky for you. We trying to build a nation. Don't think it's impossible. Let free your rain faces. Your right hook can stop a bull. We all get together. Black powers unstoppable. They poisoning the people. Take a moment to smell a fume. New York City's burning the people. We'll kill a cop or two. Let's burn the city down. Black people, we gotta move. Destroy City Hall. Shooting the helicopters too. The AK 47. Yeah, yeah, we call it the Chopper 230 inside the clip. I ain't ready for Chopper. Yeah, spits into your conscience Ain't no way you can stop the dude The flow I got is bonkers Always dropping colossal tunes Yeah, and now I'm in it Black power so real Yeah True.